Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, special meeting at six o'clock for May 14th, and we're gonna discuss the uh, Recreation Center Somatic Design Study. Can I roll call, please? Three council members are present. Council member Oliva is excused, and council member Pappen is running a few minutes late. Yeah, it's our famous uh, Bay Area traffic, so um, thank you. All right, so we have a report from staff. Thank you from our deputy uh, deputy city manager. What? Thank you. Oh, no, we're doing that next the next session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to present Andrea from Group 4 Consulting, who will guide you through this process. Um, later on this evening, you'll be approving the, well, We'll be hearing the conceptual design, or hopefully approving the conceptual design report. The next phase is schematic design, and we'll be having two sessions like this to look at some of the um, project components in a little bit more detail. So Andrea will lead you through that process, and happy to take any questions as we go through it. Welcome, Andrea. Uh, thank you. It's good to be back. Um, excuse my voice. I'm just getting over a sore throat. but. Um, so tonight, a uh, quick agenda for tonight, uh, review the project work plan. As Tiana mentioned, we are in the schematic design phase. Um, and so we're gonna do a quick recap of the conceptual design recommendation, which uh, the council approved uh, when I was last here. Uh, update on the floor plan. Uh, we have options for an exterior material palette that we'd love to get input uh, from the council tonight. Uh, and then review the site plan and some of the other landscape features uh, as part of the uh, schematic design, uh, and then recap with next steps. Um, so we're currently um, past the conceptual design. You'll be re reviewing and re hopefully approving that report, um, but we are progressing forward, moving through uh, schematic design and ongoing, uh, working simultaneously through various funding and implementation strategies. And the schematic design should phase should last approximately four to five months. Um, uh, the council previously provided direction on the design option for the park lantern design. And so that is what we'll be reviewing and working through this evening. Um, so you can see the, the renderings uh, per the conceptual design report uh, up on the screen here. Um, and just a quick recap of the building program, um, just to remember, uh, we have of course an entry lobby, community lounge, a dedicated senior lounge, uh, two classrooms, two preschool classrooms, a community room that is divisible and can seat uh, up to three to 500 seats, uh, an, a commercial kitchen that supports the community room events, a fitness studio, game room, a dedicated art room, uh, various conference rooms, vending and refreshments, uh, and of course staff and support to run and operate the facility. And we're looking at roughly uh, 25,900 square foot facility that is uh, two stories. Um, up on the screen here is the first floor. And so the main entrance as you come in is the lobby and lounge with uh, the reception that's immediately uh, in front of all of the building support and staff workroom and an adjacent conference room that can be shared both by staff and the public. Uh, just directly off the lobby and the lounge is the game room and adjacent to that is the fitness and wellness studio. Um, across the hall from that is our preschool classroom suite. So there are two classrooms there with an office, rest area, and associated prep storage and restrooms for the preschool uh, program. And then at the end of uh, the gallery is our large community room um, that is uh, illustrated here divisible by three and is supported by various uh, storage rooms, kitchen, alcoves, and uh, ki a commercial uh, catering kitchen. And then uh, I, Highlighted in gray are the other building supports such as electrical rooms, mechanical rooms, uh, various restrooms for men's, women's, as well as family. Uh, and additional park restrooms to support the park. Um, and an additional after our entrance for programs and events that are happening in the community room when the rest of the community center might be um, closed. Up on the second floor, as you ascend either via elevator or stair, is uh, another conference room, uh, the art classroom, the dedicated senior lounge and accompanying kitchenette, uh, a, a larger, more boardroom style conference room. And then at the end of the gallery are two classrooms that are again divisible, so it could be one large uh, classroom or two smaller classrooms and its associated support spaces 
uh, including restrooms and building support. And of course, um, an outdoor deck that faces the paseo. Um, as you recall, we are really thinking about how the library is going to run on day-to-day -day operations. So we have those high activity levels located on the first floor, which include the lobby, the teen and game room, fitness and wellness studio, the preschool classrooms and the community room. Um, and wanted to be sensitive that we understand those are, that's going to be a very active floor. Uh, and then that we see more moderate activity up on the second floor, so a little quieter. Um, up there with the senior lounge, conference rooms, the arts and classrooms, and uh, the, the two uh, shared classrooms. And so really thinking about the acoustics and making sure we're zoning the, the, uh, the recreation facility appropriately for the various users that will be there. Um, and again, just to highlight some of the amenities up on the second floor, um, a, a number of great views out of all of these rooms, and especially when we think about the arts and crafts classroom, having the capability of having nice northern light to support painting and other fine art programs. Um, and then as always, as what's required, um, there will be access via an elevator to the second floor, as well as areas within the stairs um, and space for refuge in case of emergencies um, or other means of evacuation. So we're gonna jump quickly in, if there's no questions, um, into the exterior materi material, different options. Um, that's really where we would like to get the most feedback from you guys, uh, from the council this evening. And so we have three options to share with you. And so here we're illustrating the various materials and where they'll be placed. Um, this is just a single uh, front elevation as you come into the parking lot. This is that main uh, elevation as you enter in the facility. And so you can see there are uh, a variety of different materials being used. Um, we have glass with their metal uh, mullions, um, a wood look soffit on the underside of the roof. Um, accent stone um, in that vertical orange area, um, and then two colors of what we're calling EFIS, which is just an exterior uh, insulated finish system, which basically is what would look like, a, like stucco, uh, if you were to think of it like that. Um, and so there are two different colors there to help break up the massing and provide a variety of finishes and colors throughout the building. And so the first option that we have here um, is we're going to have DNF pass out the samples so you can see them in person illustrated here. So we have looking at um, a variety of different stones. And the first stone that we wanted to look at was um, this is a locally sourced stone within 500 mile radius. It comes out of Las Vegas. Um, it is um, a natural stone that is mined and curry curried out of that uh, Vegas area. And the stone comes in a variety of heights and lengths, um, anywhere from two inches to four inches up to six inches. And the maximum length is 24 inches and the minimum length is six inches. So you can get a variety of heights and lengths within this material. And one of the things that we heard was that there was um, a desire to complement the brick, but without using brick, have, find a stone that might work well with the existing brick that are in the other civic facilities. And so this was a stone that's not only locally sourced, but we think works well with the brick here at uh, the city hall, as well as the library. So it picks up the red tones, a little bit of the orange and cream tones. Um, and really complements those different materials uh, within the civic campus. Uh, and then we're balancing that or contrasting that with uh, two tones of EFIS, a lighter color EFIS on the main two-story volumes, and then a slightly darker um, EFIS color and a nice warm gray um, on the lower level here. And then again, picking up uh, the wood tones on the soffit on the underside of the roof. Um, and so the three materials there. So this is option one, Gina. You're just catching up. Thank you. So she just started showing these. Uh, the second option that we have here has um, a different type of stone. This is a panelized stone system. So the, the stone comes in about one to two inches nominal height in various lengths, but it is panelized or somewhat tiled. Um, in its use, and so it has a different scale. Um, the longest stone is more 12 to 18 inches and goes down to six inches, but the height of the stone is set at about one to two inches in height. Um, and it is a, 
a contrast to the red here. So here we're looking at bringing in a, a cool kind of gray color uh, and then contrasting that by bringing in the red tone in the ephus. So accenting that with red uh, as well as a neutral tone. Um, so it has a little bit more of a darker feel and potentially uh, slightly more modern in its approach. Um, and within option two, we thought about accenting the, the gray stone with either a warm red color like brick, like the brick tone that you see here, or in a kind of a blue green color. Um, so those are two variations within the stone option of either red or accenting it with a greenish tone. Uh, and the third option that we're looking at is similar to the previous one in gray, but again, to try to find something that was in, uh, has a more warmer feel. Um, doesn't quite have as much red as the first one, but does have slight red undertones mixed with grays and cream colors. Um, and again, accenting that with a light ephus color and the two-story volume. And in this one, uh, a lighter greenish color uh, for the accent, or additionally just picking up more of the brown tones. And so again, there's two different accent ephas that we're using here. Um, this is again, similar to the first one, the stone comes in about one to two inches in height and ranges anywhere from six to 18 inches in length. Um, the option two and option three stone are not locally sourced, um, but um, great options nonetheless. So just to point out. Um, they're manufactured in the Midwest, I believe. So, um, and then sent over here. So they're uh, a synthetic kind of stone. It's, they're not a real natural quarry stone. So, uh, have a little bit more of a residential feel in their scale, um, as opposed to option one, because it comes in a variety of heights of two, four, six inches, and everywhere up to 24 inches, you can get a slightly larger scale in that, in those, in that stone. Uh, the option two and three are kind of a smaller scale stone. And so those are the three different options that we have shared with you this evening. And we'd we'll love to get uh, feedback on preferences or um, what we're liking and not liking about the various options. Questions, comments? Council Wynn. Ready? Did you have it? Did you want to start off? I, I need a little more thinking time, but um, compared to the three different types, are they in the same price? Area? Yes, all of the stones presented are within the cost per square foot that we have allocated in the current cost model. Okay, and just to make sure I've caught this, the first option, the one that has the golden, golden red stone, is fairly local, so it's got a shorter shipping distance. Yes, it's within... greener uh, that way. Yes, um, what's defined as local in uh, green standards is within 500 miles, and so it's just within 500 miles of... Uh, the site. And so that so helps us get points if we were going If for we were to products. go for lead that they consider anything within 500 miles a local material and okay. so that this the stone would contribute to that in option the stone presented in option one. Option two and three do not provide that uh, benefit. How would this how would the different materials work with what the patio in front the walkway between uh, going down towards the rest of Central Park. Does does any of these dictate then what would happen to that material? Um, we would be balancing, we'll be selecting the exact color of the site paving once we know the stone. Um, there's a greater variety in the flat work because you can stain that and you can stain it pretty much almost any color you want as you could stain anything. You can mix stains, light, dark. Um, and so there's, since there's a wider variety of finishes for that and less when you come to stone. We sort of start with the building and then let uh, the site complement the building. Um, let me look a little more then. Yeah, and I'm happy to come back to this if we want to finish the presentation and then um, uh, think about it more. Um, we were going to move into site and landscape features if you would prefer. Um, so we don't have the community, the community hasn't looked at these yet. Correct. Okay, because we've closed off that portion yes. of the process. Okay. Yes. yes. Um, we are going to be collecting engagement through this method. This process. I think a vice mayor oh. Oliver. Has yeah, I think I would just like to state my preference for the option one uh, color. 
Um, however, I don't think it goes very well with the EFIS two. Okay. Um, sort of that beige. Uh, it's it's hard to tell by the rendering, rendering exactly. Yeah, what it's it better looks to like, look at the samples. Um, it, it at least in the rendering it, it clashes a bit with that um, beige color. So I think maybe, and we talked about this quite a bit with the TOD developments that generally we don't like big white walls <laughs> for the most part uh, on exteriors. Um, so maybe something a bit uh, darker, a little bit richer uh, as the accent color there. Even this EFIS one, I think, would be a, a good accent and then have something else kind of on the, on the side there. So the EFIS two darken that slightly. Okay. Yes, correct. Yep. Council, Councilwoman Pappin. Uh, which stone, my apologies for my late arrival, which stones can vary in size? So option one varies uh, in height and length. So it comes in either two, four, or six inch heights and then varies anywhere from a minimum of six inches up to 24 inches. Um, option two and three are set in height and comes in various lengths um, that are pre, but we have no uh, dictation over, it just comes out in various lengths. So anywhere from six to 18 inches, how the manufacturer puts them out is the sizes that we will get. Um, option one, you can customize slightly more since it is um, a natural stone. Yeah, I'm gonna disagree. Option one looks a little too flintstone-y to me. <laughs> a lot of colors going on there. I think the um, darker stone in option two is um, richer. Mm -hmm. um, although I will agree if we can avoid I gotta move this stuff. Sorry, I got it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, be careful, it's heavy. All right. Um, did you get any of that, or do I have to repeat? Uh, I, I will agree that trying to avoid big white spaces is not preferred. Um, I'm curious as to the red elements um, on your option two. I'm not seeing that same reference or the same sort of pictures. Uh, on two. So option two um, can be either accented in red or or green. So it was, uh, if you like that particular stone, we felt it could go in either bring in a red or bring in a green as an accent. And you're, so you're showing in option one, you can put stone in more places, is that it? Uh, no, the amount of stone is already set and dictated based on the cost model. Okay, it's just, it, so I, I'm looking at option two and I see different renderings as far as building. Those are examples, those are the ones. Oh, the, build, the images okay. on the right are examples of other buildings, correct? I see, um, all right. That this stone has been used on. Okay, um, and I'm not, hey, so the F is, what you're calling Ephes it's one, Ephes. <laughs> I guess on number two, I think would lean towards a richer picture. I don't know where we get red from though, in some of these. Uh, so those are my thoughts as we lead into this. I, I, it's too bad. I think when you get a bigger cut of stone, I think it looks richer um, as well, but. Um, you're saying that that doesn't really happen with this other option. So um, yeah. interesting as we go along here. Anyway, preliminarily, those are my thoughts. Thank you. I, I uh, prefer option one exterior. I think it's a lot more earth tone, colorish a uh, little bit. And plus the fact that it's locally sourced makes it a plus. Um, but I think it gives it more richness, same time gives us some warmth. And one thing to know um, as regard to the color variation with the stone, we could uh, work with the quarry to try to 
um, limit the amount of variation in color if that was desired. We've previously done that on other projects where you can... Uh, Actually, I, I like the variation so. because um, everything else is just starting looking, you know, you have big slabs of color. Something that has variation of color actually adds some interest to the building. Um, Councilwoman Schneider. I agree with uh, Vice Mayor Oliver about the, the white part. And I'm looking at the other colors, and the red would be too red, obviously. Some of the colors from the other options with that one, and wondering if the version that we're seeing, because I like the red stone, I like that it's natural, I like that it's local, and it'll give us those points even if we don't go for the full lead certification. But what if we even flipped so that the darker, the, the, the FS1 that's kind of a gray mm -hmm. flipped over, I kind of like the, the blue green, but I see how well that works with the dark gray stone. Yeah. So I was looking at the other one, just wondering if there was something else a little bit darker. Oh. Yes, yeah, something, but with the, the natural stone. Yeah, yeah. I think there's opportunities to uh, play with the EFIS colors, because that is basically um, any paint in the world, so there's lots of options out there. So if, um, if everyone... So if we didn't decide that tonight, you could still go forward with the process um, as long as you know which stone we're choosing. Yes, if we could, if we have a direction or a narrow down of a, a stone, we could come back with two different variations of, of different EFIS colors and option accents of that as well okay. at the meeting that we're scheduled in, I believe, June. Question then, since I appear to be in the minority <laughs> here, I'd like to see what the... Um, option one stone is if it were less colorful and larger mm -hmm. about as large as you can get to see what um, presentation that would make on the building yeah so I we think can that would be very curious mm -hmm. as we move forward here yeah we can definitely um, have samples brought in at uh, the two four and six inch heights and the largest piece is 24 inches long so and, and could we see a rendering of that mm -hmm. with the various heights yes, as well that, yes. that would be this is rendering um the small two inch height but again I'd like to see the biggest you biggest we can do i think i would agree with that i'd like to see a larger i think it would if if the desire is mm -hmm. to simulate or kind of work with brick brick is generally more in a four or six inch height so that might help tie um these two, these facilities together as a campus. And then we can bring the, the range of colors and talk about if there's, if there's a limitation of that or if we want to embrace the variety of colors or try to define it slightly more. The, if we're headed down that path, I would like to see a smoother transition then in whatever the Ephesus are. Okay. Um, they seem pretty stark. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it's more of a community building. I think it should flow somewhat in the color spectrum and not just stark changes. Um, it, it would, if you had a stark change like this, the stonework to me should go all the way up to the top um, and on, just to kind of finish that off. Um, but that's not in any of the renderings, so. The height of the stone, uh, we're working with the manufacturer because of earthquake concerns. There is some, there may be limitations on the height that we can go with the stone, um, but we, if we know what stone manufacturer we're gonna be working with, we can try to work with them and see what the maximum limit that we can do. We didn't wanna promise all the way up to the top if we weren't gonna be able to deliver that. So, um, if we, we're, but there could be an option if, be if interesting working with them, trying to figure out if there's a way to extend that while still, of course, um, meeting earthquake requirements and standards. Well, this is, um, correct me, I'm not a <laughs> building person at all here. Is this not just a shell, um, this stonework here, or is it going to be solid all the way up? No, it's just a finished material. Just a finished material. Yeah. So I'd be interesting in seeing it go all the way up there then. Yeah. Um, if it's, of course, architecturally possible. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? No, okay. Okay, great. Um, so based on that, we will come back with um, a revised um, 
option to present in the June meeting. Um, just wanted to kind of walk through uh, the site plan. And so this is the overall Central Park site plan. Uh, outlined in red is um, the work that's currently included in the cost model. Um, here we are zoomed in here so you can uh, read things, uh, see things a little bit better. Um, but we have the, park, the main parking lot off Lincoln with 70, approximately 78 parking spaces, uh, the main entrance and promenade which, uh, that arcs around the rec center and community room, uh, and then maintaining the access off Laurel uh, with approximately 47 spaces, and the associated plazas and uh, play areas and patios around the facility. And so some of the things that we're looking at from a sustainability is office, obviously emphasizing a, a softer park appearance and so while we want to have hardscape where appropriate, um, emphasizing softscape and the use of light colored paving materials uh, for reflectance, light reflectance, uh, we're also looking at planting that's drought tolerant uh, with low irrigation requirements, uh, treating stormwater runoff locally before it enters into the bay, as well as using uh, where we can materials that are recycled or sustainable when practical. Uh, and so, so those are some of the strategies that we'll be looking at. Um, some of the features as you come in to the entry plaza, denoted here um, question. in red. Yes. Sorry. Of course. Uh, and you're surfacing like on the parking and um, throughout the hardscape. Isn't it better to use a darker color as far as greenhouse gases and all of that? Um, we tend to, uh, I don't know what the preferred, maybe Ms. Schneider knows better than I do here, but you know, if we're going to, I'd hate to see, we're gonna have to repave that um, parking area anyway. We never really get into what colors or asphalt topping is actually blessing the global warming kind of thing, from what I understand. Yeah, we don't want a heat island, so I don't, I don't know. What, which, tell, somebody tell me, but I've, I've heard that's uh, something we should be considering these days. So when uh, they look at building roofs, they're definitely looking at lighter materials because the darker materials absorb and create um, a lot more energy consumption onto the, to the building. Asphalt. Um, but asphalt is probably gonna be used in the parking area. What we're talking about is the sidewalks and associated patios and flat work. Um, the question be, so looking at the 78 space parking lot, that we make sure that it's designed so that all the water runs off into bioswales. Yes. And that there's electric power so that someday when we get a lovely grant, mm -hmm. we can put solar panels over the top, but still allow the, the landscaping to have sun, but, but do that because I would think in our future, anytime there's a flat rooftop, or a slanted rooftop in the right direction and a parking lot that it's gonna have solar on it. Yeah. And that actually extends the life of the asphalt because it's not getting as much heat and cooling during the day. But as long as we've got the power out there, even if we can't afford it now, we can come back and do it later. Yeah, we can definitely, um, I'm not, I know for sure we're making the building roof PV ready and I, for the life of me, Peter, uh, I can't recall if we were bringing it out to the park. I know I've so, brought it up and yes. I thought that at the time you said, you know, once we're tearing everything up anyway, yes. we're gonna run the conduit so Seems that we can always do it when later. the time allows. Yeah. It'll be something we'll just make double, triple check that we've got that covered. And, right. Yes, we have the EV charging as well. Ah, there uh, we go. That's required uh, by code now. So that's something that uh, will be ready and either installed when the building is open or at least be ready for EV charging. Because the last um, last I checked in with Peninsula Clean Energy, they have been trying to hire a staffer to work on distributive generation. Distributive? Distributing. Um, DG, anyway. So once they've got that person up, I'm hoping that a lot of our investment will be on solar paneling rooftops and parking lots. So I'm still slightly confused here. So you're talking Not that about I disagree with anything Ms. Schneider said at all, but uh, I have, s somebody has referenced to me, maybe Key knows, um, the color of your asphalt makes a difference. So I don't know if it's lighter or darker that's better. I, I think I've heard that the lighter, the more reflective and the more heat it's gonna give off. So I don't, uh, somebody could check that. I'm the lighter color that. is preferred. So the lighter color uh, is for preferred. For reflectance, yeah. 
You have not absorption. It's kind of like why you, why yeah. you wear white in the desert yes. versus dark colors in the desert clothing. Kind of the same principle. Yeah. Well, if we have that so red. You want lighter colors to. So you don't absorb the heat. And, and we don't use macadam here, if I pronounced it correct. If you go to Australia, a huge portion of their asphalt is actually oh. macadam, I believe is the word. It's another form of asphalt, but it's red. Okay. Yeah. And you see it everywhere from Alice Brings all the way out to the coast. And that would have a different, yeah. Any other questions on sustainability? Yes. I, I don't want to speak for the mayor, but since we both came back from Malta, and Malta is built out of this lovely golden sandstone that's just gorgeous. So the lighter colored pathway stone, uh, um, it's an opportunity if we can figure out how to make it a little refl reflective of the country of our sister city. It's really gorgeous. We went through so many stunning plazas and pathways. Um, the mayor didn't, but we got to tour a limestone factory or a limestone quarry. And then they take the old quarries and turn them into orange gardens. So orange and lemon and citrus fruit. It was just really amazing what they do there. So if we could reflect a little of that. Yeah, I think. Yeah, we can. I, I have plenty of pictures, our... more than enough to yeah. bore you if you're interested. <laughs> Ironically, I've been to Malta, so <laughs> on the brief layover. Um, so. Um, no other questions. We're going to move on. Um, okay, so as we focus in uh, some of the features of the entry plaza, obviously we want to open and welcoming places to sit uh, and gather, especially for those uh, doing pickup and drop off. Uh, planting to help soften the entrance. Uh, we, of course, want to make sure we have the appropriate wind protection uh, for those uh, entering into the facility, uh, parking for bicycles, as well as making sure we have a good connection um, from Taylor Middle School for those students um, passing through the site and wanting to enter directly into the facility. Um, and then as we look at the, the Paseo, uh, a mixture of warm and cool materials. Um, so. This is really a transition from that entry plaza into and the courtyard into the park. Um, so making sure that we have different kind of paving delineations and textures, as well as being accessible, um, which is true of all spaces here. And so you can see some of the examples on the right of some of the colors and uh, materials that we're looking at. Uh, and still having maybe while there is a single color variety and textures. Um, as we think about the central courtyard, um, creating outdoor spaces uh, with that strong permanent arching seat wall to help define those spaces uh, and, the, and a planting strip to, again, help delineate those. Um, we're looking at using a specimen tree as a focal point, and we'll uh, share with you our thoughts on that. And then, of course, places to sit and gather and socialize as uh, those either utilizing those from the indoor or passing by. Um, and then when we think about the fitness room terrace again paving that contrast with the central courtyard to help again delineate those spaces um, separately from each other Question. yes um, if we wanted to use this space for an art show in the future is there anything that we should be considering in the design phase obviously we can't do it on a really windy day mm -hmm. but if we find time that might not be windy if we're setting up easels or things like that do do the, does your world ever look at that um, I, we have not done exterior public art, predominantly because of um, how to deal with security. With and this would work. be temporary. This would be okay. more like a show, not a Oh, just for a couple yeah. of hours. Yeah, yeah. Okay, nothing there. Um, we have not, but I would, so we'd have to think about what some of the, con how that might be best handled. We would probably want to do something a little bit more permanent with easel. So we've done things where we have uh, stations where things could be inserted into the ground and then covered when not used. And so we might want to install mm -hmm. something to help support stations that are a little bit more sturdy than I think easels, which would probably have issues with tipping and wind. Mm -hmm. um, and then if how, again, you are hanging or placing the artwork, whether it's uh, 2D or 3D. Great. Thank you. Councilman, Councilwoman Pappen. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, along those lines, mm -hmm. um, and emphasizing what Ms. Schneider said here, 
I think the back of the grand hall or whatever we're calling it might be a wonderful idea for um, placing some of those secure things. Should we do umbrellas out there at some point? Um, that would be really nice and probably less, per I mean, more protected. Should there be an art show mm -hmm. or something like that? Maybe that would be, outside. yes, Indoor inside, outside, outside, instead of the Paseo area here. Yeah. I think that would be a really wonderful addition. Um, on your site features landscape, um, I see the, if you could, yeah, there. Okay, the bottom one there appears to have lighting almost underneath, is that yes, correct? I like that a lot. I don't know if you could do it around all the, tra you know, some, we're gonna have to worry about lighting throughout this area at night mm -hmm. and security wise. So the more of that we could see really makes it look more elegant. Also the one on top there, if we could include some sort of um, either solar or electrical feature there for the future, um, it would be really lovely during the holiday season to light those trees in such a way. Um, just to give us that option in the future, mm -hmm. um, it would be great to include those types of features now. Yeah. Uh, and also going back one more page, yeah. Um, I'm not thrilled with the um, shape of those seating arrangements currently. <laughs> I am letting my opinion know now. You guys can all <laughs> say that later, but um, taste-wise, I think, because you've got on the next page, it looks slightly more formal. Okay. And then you're going to the complete, I, I would like to see a little more, an option as to structure on those, that they flow more um, with the ones that you have on the next page. More formal. Yeah, more formal because both of the ones you have on this page and the one above it on my thing are just a little too rounded and I don't think reflective or complementary to the building as it's being presented. So just as an option, I would like to see something a little more formal on that, please. And then we can see how I'm right later, the rest of them. It's okay. Thank you. Councilwoman Schneider. Just along those lines, and we're jumping to a slide you haven't shown yet, so the public hasn't seen it yet. Um, the next slide shows uh, wood. And when you took us on the tour, we saw those lovely the, the Palo Alto one, and they had a lot of teak benches inside, and it wasn't that old, and they were already getting, I mean, teak weathers. It's supposed to weather, but it also was splintering, which teak can do. I have teak in my backyard as a planting shed, and I have to treat it every year. So I, I love the wood, but it takes a lot of care. And then we can go to plastic lumber, and then you have how hot it gets. So how do you find a nice mesh between, like, the site features where you've got a around, you've got a tree and a circle, that one, and part of it is cement and part of it is wood. How do you do that with materials that survive, don't have a lot of maintenance, and don't get real hot? I, I think if there was the <laughs> perfect material, everyone would use that material. Um, I think it's a balance of trying to find out the right maintenance that the city is willing to accept, as well as, um, making sure we have a, a variety of textures as well as think about the heating and cooling aspect of someone sitting on it. So um, I think at the next meeting, we're gonna start talking about some of the site finishes. So this is just a okay. primer to what you're gonna see. And so I think we can come back to exactly what those finishes might be now that we have a better understanding of what the building might be looking like and what stone we might be using. And when you do, you'll give us options that are sustainably harvested and that can pass the FSC for us? Yes, anything, any of the wood we'd want to do is FSC certified. Uh, if not, a wood, a wood simulated material that would either be recycled or recyclable. Very good. Any other comments from any other council members? Okay. Um, so moving on to uh, the community room event terrace. Again, this is really an outdoor space supporting events um, that are happening within the community room and uh, obviously overlooking the park, uh, making sure that we have a path and a seat wall to help define that terrace. 
Uh, you can sort of see we are having picking up uh, a fair amount of uh, grade change within that area. And so the community room terrace is quite a bit higher than the rest of the park that's just adjacent to that. And so this little section here illustrates how we would have a seat wall, uh, a sloped area with planting, and then our uh, rainwater feature garden uh, directly below that. Um, shrub planting edge as a buffer to this and the shrub bedding as a, a buffer to that stormwater basin. Uh, and then of course protection when we think about uh, late afternoon wind and breezes for those events. Um, I just came, yeah. Um, to, to maximize the use of that uh, open porch can also be used kind of a performance stage as well. Um, so is, can we move this swell out a little bit further so we can have some seating that we can put out on, a, on the lawn? And I'm sorry, so the stage would be the terrace and the, the audience would be? It was, okay, so the audience would be over the swell? Um, so can you build a bridge over so people can get to this? You know, some place where people can, you know, we can put seats out and people can, you could treat it like an open stage as well. So, um, I, yeah, I was trying to figure out where the present, where we have the stage on the inside. So there, we currently don't have a, a, a platform within the community room. Uh, there's opportunities to bring in a portable stage. Um, but if we were to treat the terrace as a stage, um, the size of the basin, uh, the bioswale stormwater basin is dictated by the amount of water that's coming off of the roof. So um, we can't just reduce it to any length or size that we would need, but we could relocate it or help move that into a different area. Or so build. We'd have to come back and try to figure out if we're not treating it here, where are we gonna treat that water? Uh, maybe, or the other option is, is, is there a, 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 a kind of area that provides kind of a neither you know, slope into or a flat area where you can put seating? Or you're, do you think on the east side, so going down towards Palm Avenue, so the opposite side of where the room is, right. bring the hill up a little bit there, just grade it up a little bit? Yeah. Well, the park master plan does have sort of an informal amphitheater yeah. along that slope. Opposite side. Um, farther down. Of the, of yeah, but I mean, it's better when you can have it indoor. That way, you, you know, when you have costumes and equipment, stuff like that, you can still be covered a bit and store your equipment, having to haul it outside. You know, it's just, I mean, this is, if you go to San Mateo's uh, uh -huh. rec center, they can open up the stage, open up both sides, so then they can have outdoor theater. Where, so it doubles. One? The one in uh, Central Park, Washington, you know, next to the baseball diamond. Yeah, I'm I, the, I, uh, I recreation I've center. Yeah, go over there and you'll see that, uh, that they open up the, the rec center uh, back of the stage and they open it up and then they the put back. seating outside um, so it can double as a, so I'm not saying put a stage there, but it can, it can automatically be a stage once you open it up. Um, so you can get double use out of that out of that space. Yeah, and no, I was just trying to go back. I, the the basin doesn't extend all the way. But we do have an existing tree that we're avoiding here, and so maybe there's opportunities more the northern mm. edge um, to accomplish something like that. Um, but to note the recall the the playground uh, is just adjacent to that, so there would be limited lengths of where we could provide seating before we then hit the playground area. If I'm understanding correctly, the audience that you're saying is down here, correct? Uh, well, I, I just, I just want to use most, yeah, that yeah. use, use yeah, double the use. Double of use, the use of that terrace. Right, so um, rather than just being a con place to congregate, people can use it as a, uh, a stage for performances, mm -hmm. and it'd be pretty nice. So, um, and then, or weddings or whatever, outdoor wedding, and if there was opportunity to put seating outside, um, if, yeah. So neither we build like you keep the swell, and you build a bridge over it, and then you have a flat area, or you move the swell out further out or something um, to provide some space for seating. Okay, let yeah. us look at that and see what we can come back with as far as the outdoor performance area. And question, Mr. Murray. Yes. So your outside patio there really seems to narrow at the um, southern end there a lot. Um, why is that, that we're doing that? I mean, um, really well, we were to trying to 
be able to secure the patio so it wouldn't so in the evenings you can see a small sort of gated area or per area where you could sort of close that area off so it wouldn't be somewhere where someone would try to uh, make a home in the evening, I guess, so to speak. Um, so we were trying to just make sure that that patio was secure and delineated so that it was clearly working within the community room and not a space that anyone would sort of walk into unless they were coming and using it in conjunction with the community room. So it's not a terrace that's like a park amenity, but it's an amenity for the community center and recreation center, I'm sorry. And so we we're just trying to delineate and define that. Um, yeah, I, I understand the thought process. I still would like to maximize enough of mm -hmm. number five there as noted so that we are not, um, it just becomes more utilitarian, I guess, the bigger it is there. I yeah. think we can figure out security in another way somehow there and also are we putting in something we had discussed some sort of a um, heating element like a fire pit or something um, yes there's been the different things that we've been discussing and i think will be something we'll bring back at the next meeting okay so my my concern would be is the current rendition is presented there it goes off a little too narrow towards the end there right. and this is our maximum entertainment feature. <laughs> yeah. So I would hope that we can maximize that. Thank you. Great. Okay, um, so we have um, the Mills Dragon team out there gonna perform for us for the next uh, meeting. So um, can we continue this discussion to the next, uh, Don't uh, you need the next the me the meeting this uh, it's evening? It's 6.53. Do you need set up? I know we're getting close, so we, yeah, well, how much more do we have? Uh, I, we're getting very close to then, just a handful of slides. Okay. So, um, I, I think moving on just into looking at some of the site furnishings. Uh, so we're looking at new benches, uh, similar in a style or material to the recreation center, um, some curvilinear benches for social area gathering in those feature areas, and then more of your traditional straight bench for your general purpose areas. Uh, and then looking at uh, bike racks, again, that are circular in form to respond to that arching and curvilinear landscape features that we have. And as far as the material of wood, um, we can come back and address whether that is uh, a sustainably harvest wood or whether that's uh, simulated wood. Uh, when we look at planting, again, California native and climate appropriate planting, uh, looking at massing of plants with structures uh, closer to the buildings, um, habitat friendly with seasonal color, uh, low maintenance, low water use, um, and some textured planting along Lincoln Circle and the Taylor Middle School. Uh, and then of course, shaded parking a uh, lot with uh, wind buffering to provide wind buffering. Um, when we look at the planting in the tre rainwater treatment areas, um, so again, wanna make sure it's green and attractive planting. Um, there is an opportunity potentially for art in, in those areas, uh, a medium amount of maintenance and water use and bioretention at uh, grade plantings, as well as the potential for educational engagement within those areas to help demonstrate and explain uh, what the bioswales are doing and how they're uh, retaining and clarifying clearing the water. Um, as we presented a variety of trees, um, we shared two trees. Uh, the staff had a preference for using the Chinese elm. This is the specimen tree that we were talking about um, at the central courtyard, just outside of the community room. And so this was uh, the staff preferred uh, scheme. The other one that we had shared with them is a su su Southern live oak. And then as we look at the variety of other trees within the site, um, again, a variety of shapes and forms and color to help bring uh, seasonal change to the site. So these are sampling of the trees and that we'll come back with exactly where these trees are planted uh, later. I can't remember where I was, but somebody was going, um uh, talking about manzanitas, and I admit to liking manzanitas because they can get very sculpture, and they've got that red bark mm -hmm. that may complement the stone. So I don't know if you want to think about some manzanita, and I've told the city manager this, the airport has been 
doing a lot of building and putting in some drought tolerant landscapings. And then when I was there at a training a month ago, there were uh, tulips and other bulb, things that we wouldn't think of as drought tolerant, but they pop through for that splash of color. And it was really lovely. So it's kind of a little bit of the drought tolerant, but when the rain's falling, why not get some, some bulbs in there? And then they die back by the time we don't need to water anymore. So go, go on, look at their new, um, it's their new staff where their noise office is. Okay. And, but it's that we actually saw it quite a few different places around the airport and really stunning looking. Great, I will share that. Um, and then as we look at um, other planting, uh, landscape planting in the area, again, just a variety of textures, colors, um, formal and more informal types of plantings. Again, we'll come back at the next meeting with a planting plan that illustrates uh, where each one of these uh, plants and trees will be. But this is just a, the palette that our landscape architect will be using. Can we throw one more in there? Yeah. Ceanothus. Okay. Really great for bees, purple flowers. Mm -hmm. This has been a great year for Ceanothus, but again, another California native, multiple species. Great. We'll add that to the list. And then again, so just wrapping up, if there's no other comments, uh, we'll be presenting to the Planning Commission as well as the Parks and Recs Commission uh, in June, and then coming back for our second uh, City Council design session in early July, where we will share updated site and building design, as well as start reviewing some of the interior finishes and layouts of the building. So, a lot happening. Great. Okay. Just in time. Great, thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take a quick break and we assemble outside for performance by the Mills Dragon Team in celebration of uh, Asian Herit uh, Heritage Awareness Month. Um, so everybody's welcome to go outside and, and uh, enjoy the uh, entertainment and we'll reconvene soon after that.
Okay, good evening everybody. Thank you for attending the uh, May 14th um, meeting of the City Millbury City Council. Can I have roll call please? Four council members are present. Council member Oliva is excused. Okay, thank you. Um, and Councilwoman Oliva sends her deepest regrets. She wanted to be here for uh, all the ceremonies. So can I impose on Mark Kelly, president of the Mill, Mill High School student body to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, Mark. I just uh, just want to give a few shout out to Mark. He did a phenomenal job this year leading the leadership in Mills High School. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. we have the first order of business. We have uh, we want to recognize the art show winners, and I also like to uh, also give a shout out to Councilwoman Schneider who uh, shepherded this project. Uh, this project was dormant for a long time, and Councilman Schneider brought it back. And um, it's it's something that we sorely really need it um, to show and have the, our, our residents able to express their abilities in art and their and their special uh, specialties and their then uh, their uh, and their uh, well, I'm missing the words but <laughs> skill sets. Well, it's more than that. Just talents. Yeah, talents. So um, let's see. We have uh, three or four art pieces here and uh, of course uh, there were many and they were very difficult to choose. I went to the art show and it was very difficult uh, uh, you know, choices to make but uh, the judges somehow did it. So I would like to ask uh, Eleanor Somoza, Faith Lee, um, Emmy Lee Wan and Gwyneth Zhang up to the podium please. Mr. Mayor, one more. So we have, do we have accommodations for them or? Yeah, where are they? they're in here. All right. All right. Okay, so can I have uh, Brian Chan, Mark uh, Schaffholder, Isaac Leon, is that right? Schaffholder, sorry. The, uh, the beast, right? <laughs> beast in the, in the, the beast and beauty and the beast, awesome. <laughs> Cyrus Leon, um, uh, up to the podium. Coming up, coming up. Oh, coming up. All right, so um, as I mentioned outside, the uh, Mills uh, Dragon team and Mr. Phillips, could you come up here too, Mr. Phillips? Mr. Yes, all, I know Mr. Phillips is very modest. He, he, he likes to celebrate the students, which is awesome, but I think, there's, I think, there's, I think we also like to acknowledge Mr. Phillips for, for helping <laughs> make this possible. <laughs> 
So Mr. Phillips and, uh, and other parent leaders have uh, shepherded this team for many, many years. And can you tell us a little bit about the, the Dragons? Anybody want to tell us a little oh, bit about yeah, Dragons? I'll, I'll do that. Sure. So a brief history. Oh, um, yourself, um, hello, I'm Brian. <laughs> a brief history. Uh, Dragon Team was founded 21 years ago. For the last 20 years, uh, we've participated in the SF Lunar Parade. Uh, we've placed first and second this, this past year. We placed first in our specialty division. Um, the Dragon is... Uh, 111 feet long, and we have 67 members. All of our coaches, except uh, Mr. Lee, are past and former participants of Dragon Team. Cyrus here is a former uh, Dragon Team participant, and he's our coach right now. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Lee, for having us. Diff different Mr. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so if, uh, again, uh, this, again, hearty congratulations, and is you guys um, also help us celebrate the, uh, our, 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 um, our adopted uh, unit, the 101st Screaming Eagles, and they were very thrilled by that, so thank you for doing that. Um, and you guys are tried a, quite a treasure for Millbrae, so uh, thank, I hope you keep participating, some of you who are graduating, and uh, thank you for coming back. Um, and again, this is, this is quite an honor for Millbrae to have a uh, award-winning Dragon team. So if we can get a picture in front here, that'd be awesome. So that dragon head, understand, is uh, every year is you know, refurbished or redone. So they, the kids do that themselves. They didn't buy it off the shelf. So uh, if you want to take a look at that dragon head, uh, I would take I would take advantage of that. Okay. So we have a uh, proclamation for uh, National Public Works. Key Lim is the Director of Public Works and also our Deputy uh, City Manager. Um, and Key um, is going to represent uh, all the hardworking men and women who uh, ensures that our sewers are not backflowing <laughs> and that our water is running uh, and you get uh, and you so you can flush your toilet and, and have water for food and substance um, and also make sure that our roads are, um, are, are paved and ensure that the uh, water flows and uh, storm drains are unclogged and traffic signals and a lot of things that we take for granted every day is not glorious, it's not sexy, but it makes the city, uh, it makes the city very vibrant and it makes our city special because um, all the little things, including making sure cleaning downtown and street sweeping and making it very uh, uh, friendly to visitors and residents is all due to the hard work of public works um, and I especially appreciated it because when I was last time mayor, there were eight water main breaks. <laughs> and uh, they worked tirelessly for two days to fix all those water mains so that people can get water in their houses. And I just want to thank you and recognize you for uh, your and your crew. And, of course, uh, I know you're very proud of them. Would you like to say a few words for them? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Lee and Vice Mayor Holliver and members of the, uh, Millbury City Council, Key Lim Public Works Director. I'd like to say thank you very much. And I, on behalf of our 57 members strong of Public Works Department, thank you, thank you very much. And we also have something that we'd like to present to the City Council tonight. Every year, the American Public Works Association publish a poster for National Public Works Week. And this year, the theme is, it starts here. So we'd like you to have this poster. And on top of that, we are going to be doing a, um, a city picnic uh, next week on Tuesday. And the flyers are here. And it's going to start at 11.30 at the treatment plant. And after the barbecue, the picnic, we're going to be conducting a, uh, a little tour of the uh, treatment plant facilities. And any of you, I would love for you guys to come join us. And I will pass the uh, flyer to Eileen. And also, lastly, We have some really beautiful gifts away for our council members. We have reusable water bottle. <laughs> and again, I'll pass that out to uh, Elaine. 
Thank you, Elaine. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor? Yes. And we really want to thank you for um, the current work on the um, uh, crosswalks and all of that. Um, it's been, we've gotten a lot of comments from the public uh, about how nice they look now and hopefully we'll keep our residents safer than ever before. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry, the, the tour of the sewage treatment plant, is that just for council members or open to the public? We have also invited the Rotary Club and I just want to let you guys know that uh, we are now officially proud members of the Rotary Club. A few of us, our city manager Tom Williams, Deanna and myself. And then we are opening the uh, picnic and the tour to also uh, the Rotary uh, members and they'll be conducting their board meeting at the uh, treatment plant on that same morning. But to also keep any member of the public is interested in taking a tour, they can contact right. you or myself. And yeah, I, I think there were, I have gotten several available. requests. So if anybody who would like to, again, like to tour the treatment plant, please go to our website and email uh, Key Lim or city manager Tom Williams and they will put you on the list. Okay, I guess I'm gonna replace this with this. <laughs> All right. So um, we have a special recognition and we wanted to thank one of our premier clubs, uh, which was voted the best, um, the best small club in the district. Uh, and, uh, and they are uh, small but very mighty, uh, Millbrae Rotary Club. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, we ha we're going to uh, recognize the uh, students of the year as proclaimed by the uh, Millbury Rotary Club, Layla Wong, uh, Matakoko Ma Iwata, please come up and, and, and help me fin uh, <laughs> say your name correctly, Ashwin Ranji and Rafaela Radan and Kayla Lee. So can you come up to the uh, podium with me? Can I have the Rotary Club come up, uh, re representative Rotary Club come up and say a few words too? Good evening everybody. So this um, program that we've had has been at least 20 years because I've been in Rotary almost 20 years and it was in place when we started. And what we do is we ask the principals and then the teachers of that class, if you're fifth grade, the fifth grade teachers, if you're eighth grade, the eighth grade teachers, to choose, sorry, oh, is that better? To choose a student that uh, not only is a good student, but truly exemplifies the rotary motto of service above self. That is the most important thing as far as we're concerned because it talks about their character and how they treat people and how they go through their lives. And it's really amazing what these young people do on a regular basis. It's really heartwarming. I'd, I'd like to back up just one little bit and thank Public Works. I'm a big fan of Milbrae sewers. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm happy to be here honoring our students that were chosen by their teachers, by their schools. Thank you kindly for your attention. Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself as Mary Lee just told me. I'm Deirdre Gladwin, immediate past president of the Rotary Club of Millbrae. And uh, I'm, I'm the current president, Janet McCauley.
Okay, again, thank you to the students of the year. Um, it's uh, quite an accomplishment. Keep up the good grades and stay out of trouble. <laughs> okay, so uh, can we get agenda overview by the city manager, please? Oh, wait, oh, PCBA is not, they're not available today. Thank you. Oh, wait, no, never mind. I have one more comment. I have the Asian Heritage. Uh, Okay, it wasn't on. Okay, my, my bad. I missed one. Okay, so Asian Heritage. Um, let's see, do we have uh, anybody from the Japanese culture arts? I mean, uh, Peninsula Clean Energy, I mean, uh, uh, Peninsula Chinese Business Association's not here. Uh, maybe we can get MCC Alice Kwan, uh, Niwa Chan, are you here? John Chang, come on up. Why aren't you coming up to? Okay, so um, this is uh, May is the uh, Asian American Pacific Island Heritage Month, and um, it was started in June 1977 by Jimmy Carter, and uh, it started off as uh, Heritage Week, but uh, President Obama uh, has uh, declared it as a uh, monthly celebration and awareness and. Uh, a lot of Asians uh, contribute to the uh, American life, and uh, I like to say that uh, I was born on an army base, so I'm army issued, uh, Asian American. And people ask me where I'm from. I always say I'm from America. So um, I don't. I think that the reason why, and hopefully in, in the future, um, I think it's good to celebrate different cultures because it brings uh, some color into our lives. Um, and I'm hoping that in the future that we may not have to have um, these type of awareness, uh, but all just this, but for the fact to celebrate our heritage. And, uh, and these people here who are up here uh, helped us do this just recently at the uh, Chinese or Lunar New Year Festival. They organized this event in three months, which was usually done in eight months. So I just want to thank you, Alice Kwan, Warren, uh, Warren Young, John Chang, and uh, Niwa Ch Chang, right? Thank you very much. So I just also just came from uh, Utah. Uh, went to uh, Promontory Summit, where they celebrated the 150th spike of the Transcontinental Railroad. And for 150 years, the Chinese would never ever acknowledge as uh, working on that railroad. 12,000 people worked on it. 1,200 of them died building that railroad. Um, they built the hardest, the most difficult part, which was t going through the Sierra. They were dynamited, uh, dynamiting, or not dynamite, they were um, using black powder to, uh, to break up the granite rocks to build tunnels through the Sierra. Um, and they were excluded from the final photo of the Golden Spike. And I just wanted to go, I went there this, yes, uh, on Friday to make up for that. So a lot of us went there to make up for that photo. And um, Elaine Chow, the, uh, the uh, Secretary of, Tra of the uh, Transportation was there to, to uh, make that point, and uh, it wasn't just the Asians who were involved. There was the, the uh, Mormons and in American Indians, uh, ex-Confederate, -conf ex ex-Union uh, workers. Um, but uh, and and notably, uh, and it's still a record. Chinese built uh, 10 miles of track all in 12 hours, and that's still a world's record. So. I think that uh, Asians also uh, endure quite a bit of ch uh, challenges, including being excluded because I can't, you know, they were excluded from having homes, they were excluded from having jobs, they were excluded from coming into the uh, United States for the longest time. Um, and uh, I for fortunately started off in California, in fact. Um, but I think uh, we changed that. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, it's, it's easy because Asians are, Easily uh, different than, than looks than, than other population in America, um, and and even today they're still being treated as uh, different. But I think Ameri uh, we uh, Americans, Chinese American, Asian Americans, Japanese American, Korean Americans, uh, we contribute and we like to uh, not just be recognized, but also we just want to so show that we are Americans and we love our country just as much as anybody else, 
and that uh, if, if you want to know more about that, the 442nd is celebrating their anniversary, and they were the most decorated World War II unit made up of Japanese American, whose families were interned, uh, but they fought for America, and they were the most awarded and decorated unit uh, in the United States history. Um, and, they're so and they're dwindling down their population. Uh, but they did it with even knowing that their, parent, their family were interned in, in, uh, in, in camps. Uh, and I want to say that the Japanese were the only intern, but they were, for most part, the largest race uh, and, easi and easily the most identifiable. So I'm hoping that we don't repeat history. I'm hoping that everybody stands up when we see injustice, when we see people who are uh, at um, particularly like the Muslims are now today, are being targeted, um, and I'm hoping that we as a country stand up for everybody's rights, uh, whether you be whatever color, creed, or religion that you belong to, that we all know that we all bleed the same color. Um, and also I'd like to announce that the, uh, the Asians in this, not just Asians, but the Asian caucus in San Mateo County has formed, and they're gonna have a reception on the 23rd, and the point is, is to bring awareness, and anybody can join. It, you don't have to be Asian to join. So, but if you want to uh, enrich in the culture in San Mateo County, then I think that's a good organization to be involved with. So uh, um, to make it sh to conclude, I just want to thank everybody uh, in the city of Millbrae for uh, celebrating all of our cultures, uh, but this is particularly today and this month, uh, Asian American uh, Heritage Month. And I just want to thank you very much for everybody's participation and everybody's contribution. Okay, thank you staff for uh, keeping me on track. So can we, uh, are we up to the agenda now? Yeah. All right, let me start. All right, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Tom Williams, City Manager. Um, just a quick uh, briefing of what's going on in the city of Millbrae. Um, every third Friday of the month, uh, it's Millbrae Goes to the Movies, and so this Friday night, um, May 17th, it will be showing Incredibles 2 at Central Park. And again, there's games, snacks, uh, free screening of Incredibles 2. Uh, the movie uh, takes place outdoors again in Central Park, um, and it, it festivities begin at 6 p.m. with the movie starting at, at uh, sundown. So we hope to see everybody there. We do know that there's rain in the forecast uh, all week starting tonight, except for Friday. Um, so we still plan on having the movies. If it's too wet, then we will provide notice on Friday morning, but we're still planning on, on having the movies outdoors. So we hope to see everybody there. Um, also, um, a few Saturdays ago, April 27th, the Millbrae community um, celebrated uh, Arbor Day and Earth Day. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone that showed up. We had about 160 volunteers uh, that planted 20 oak trees along the Spur Trail. We picked up more than 700 pounds of litter uh, and recyclable materials around the city. So we accomplished very much and we thank everyone that um, turned out uh, to volunteer to help beautify the city. Uh, also, um, last Saturday, May 11th, um, we had an incredible uh, bike rodeo um, that was led by our Sheriff's Department and especially uh, uh, Chief Kunkel um, that, that led in partnership with the CHP, uh, the Millbrae School District, uh, the Lions Club, CERT, um, it was, uh, it was more successful than we had anticipated. Um, about 300 free helmets were given away to the youth and over 300 hot dogs uh, that were given away by the Lions Club, excuse me, 420. So it was, it was a great event. So we thank you, Chief, uh, the Sheriff's Department, um, our staff, um, Millbrae School District staff, everyone that participated. 
Um, we are also now accepting applications for Millbrae commissions and committees. Um, so if you're interested, uh, please check out our website. Uh, there's volunteer opportunities on several of our commissions and committees. You can also contact the city clerk at area code 650-259-2414 uh, if you're interested. Um, also, a couple things of note. Um, every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Uh, in our temporary recreation center is a free bread and baked goods giveaway um, that is hosted by... Uh, by us, but um, the baked goods come from Safeway and Trader Joe's. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. It's 75 to 80 percent off on breads and baked goods, and it's it, and it's always a big success. So uh, if you're not aware of it, please, every Wednesday morning, uh, starting at 8 a.m. in the Temporary Recreation Center, uh, bread and baked goods. Uh, and then also, I noticed when I was when I was over in the um, Temporary Recreation Center that our Millbrae Senior Knitting and Craft Club. Uh, do some incredible things, and they sell, uh, they actually sell what they, uh, what they produce. And I noticed, being a sports fan, um, that there's some really neat um, 49ers and Giants, um, uh, for example, um, knitted um, tissue display cases and things like that. So, you know, for 3 or $4, you can help, um, help the seniors and, and benefit their program. So go over and take a look at it. Um, it's, there's, some, there's some good stuff. Um, and Mr. Mayor, that concludes a, a brief staff report of everything that's going on. And I, I mean, I would be remiss not to thank the staff for stepping it up. It was noticed tonight our public works department is doing a dynamite job. Um, all, all departments, I just I can't thank them enough for just a great job that they're doing uh, over the last several months. So thank you to all the staff. <coughs> also, um, also thank the staff for um, conducting the uh, youth summit, uh, sustainability youth summit. Um, in the last few days, uh, Shelley Ryder, uh, is with the help of Mackenzie Brady, helped put, together, put that together quickly um, and with the guidance of Councilwoman Schneider to try to, uh, try to win some grants that the county is, is offering. And the youth got together uh, to, to brainstorm ideas with the help of staff. Um, and staff's going to, it's been phenomenal in that respect. So thank you for the Public Works Department um, and the recreation department. And also thanks, thanks to the uh, sheriff's department, they really stepped up in the uh, bike rodeo and made it a phenomenal uh, community event. Uh, maybe uh, the other cities will start to, uh, will emulate, want to emulate that program. And also kudos to Councilwoman Schneider for uh, pushing for the, the uh, bike rodeo and heading that up as uh, elected. So thank you very much, Councilwoman Schneider. Just because you mentioned it, we had visitors from both South City and San Bruno taking notes. So hopefully we can give them our helpful hints and we pass it forward or pay it forward. Um, Councilman Patton. And uh, I guess we thank to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission who provided the um, bike, uh, what do you want to call it, bike station where you could get your bike um, evaluated and... Um, Actually repaired and tuned up and, and uh, it, was, yeah, yeah um, tube so replacements, uh, it, that was, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, we didn't know they sponsored that, but those individuals go around and uh, you can get um, your bike uh, fixed up a bit. So thank that's, you. That's not a cheap service too, because uh, I wish I was around, because that's about $75. Is it about $75? Uh, yeah, that's not cheap. Again, nice job and thank you, Ms. Schneider, for leading the way on that one, thanks. Hey, um, thank you, yeah. Mayor. Um, now moving towards the agenda, uh, quick overview. Uh, item number two is the agenda uh, overview. Um, under that item, we have a calendar of events for information, reports of bills and claims for information. Item number three is approval of the meeting minutes for the regular meeting of April 9th and April 23rd. Uh, there are no oral reports from any city committee or commission chairs this evening. Uh, after that, we have public communication, and that's for anybody um, of the public that would like to address the city council speaking for three minutes on items not on the agenda. After that, we move to the consent calendar. Item number five is a resolution awarding a construction contract to EPS, doing business as express plumbing for the sewer modernization program at Cappuccino High School in the, vic in the vicinity of Cappuccino High School. That's a sewer upgrade project. Item number six is a resolution accepting replacement of the existing carpet here at the city of Millbrae. Um, as complete and filing a notice of completion. Item number seven is a resolution awarding construction, uh, a, co a construction contract to G. 
Bortolotto and Company for the 2019 pavement maintenance program. And just real quick on that, that will be done in time for the um, Lions car show. I verified that. Item number eight uh, is adopt a resolution authorizing city manager designee to execute the first addendum to the agreement for professional services with GHD for on-call engineering services and extend their contract for one year and increase the compensation by an aggregate amount not to exceed $300,000 for fiscal year 2018-19 and fiscal year 2019 and 20. Item number nine is a resolution authorizing the city manager designee to execute the first addendum to the agreement for professional services with Beliche and Associates. This is for the old Bayshore Highway and Rollins Road pavement repair project. Um, we also will need to increase the budget to a total amount not to exceed $38,960. Uh, that is from original contract of $118,392 to $150,352. There was some infrastructure that was found um, underneath the pavement that uh, no one knew about, so that increased the cost. Item number 10 is a uh, consider adoption of a resolution approving the mayor's attendance to the 87th annual meeting of the United States Conference of Mayors on June 28th through July 1st uh, at the request um, of staff and the mayor, that item will be continued. So we're removing it from the agenda this, e this evening and perhaps continuing that to the June 11th um, meeting. So that will not be heard tonight. Moving into public hearings, item number 11. Uh, this is a continuation of the Gateway Millbrae Station area design, uh, their review permit. So we still have some work to do uh, with the applicant on the materials and color for the hotel. Also, uh, we'd like to bring back at the same time the monument sign on Millbrae Avenue and the landscaping of the median. So we still have work to do. So at the request of the applicant, we would like to continue that item to June 11th as well. Item number 12 under existing business is the Recreation Center uh, restoration project to one, receive the informational update on the um, final Recreation Center uh, first phase of the project and accept the final report. Uh, under new business, um, item 13, is to review and affirm the city's position regarding opposition to Senate Bill 50. This is the uh, Senator Wiener's bill um, on uh, allowing uh, multifamily housing units by right under state law um, and usurping local control. After item 13 is council comments and then adjourning the meeting in memory of several people that we will make comment of. So with that, that's the overview of the agenda this evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Thank you. Any questions? Um, on the continuation of item 11, will we be able to see particularly the signage beforehand um, or you know, as soon as possible on that front? It's concerning to many of us. Uh, yes, Council Member. We'll have that information in City Council prior to the meeting. Anything else? Okay, so um, on item 10, the mayor's conference thing, um, just for those people who are wondering why we pulled it, it's, it's pretty obvious that uh, the, the uh, cost is eye popping, um, but I wanted to make sure that uh, the council heard it because this is not just about this one um, conference, this is about the fact that do we want to participate in future mayor conferences? Um, and the uh, price tag, is uh, w there are some things we can do to reduce that, but I think that we wanna talk about the value of participating in this. And the reason why is because we had a presentation by sta uh, Congresswoman Spears staff about the fact that a lot of cities um, did not know that there were federal grants that, uh, that the cities could take advantage of. And those are normally discussed at these type of conferences. Um, so, and other cities in the, in the county have recognized that and they're sending their mayors. So that's something we want to talk about. Um, and along those lines too, the um, annual meeting of the United States Conference of Mayors is exceptionally important. Um, I think part of the cost issue too is here, we're not a member. So if we could address that in the future, the cost is reduced if we become a member of this organization. Um, and I know how important these meetings have been in past, um, for many, many different cities. So um, when we look at and evaluate that, um, I'd appreciate finding out what it costs to, for our city to join this conference so that um, any future 
expenditures are reduced there. Yeah, well, this conference is never going to be cheap because it's always at a um, Class A city, and our hotel bills are always high. Um, so it's never going to be cheap, but this question is if it's worth the value to the city citizens of Millbury. So, okay, so let's move on to, um, to the um, minutes. And I knew there, was a f there was a change that the vice mayor has pointed out. Um, mm -hmm. And with those changes, for what day was that again? I believe that was for April 23rd. It was, there was a reference to the mayor of Malta, and I believe it should be mayor of Mosta. Right. Right. There's a president of Malta right. and a, a mayor of uh, Malta. Yes, uh, Austin Senator. I, I'm not sure what protocol is for excused, other than we're not here clearly. Um, so I had already talked to the city manager about referencing that I stayed in Malta and you came back in time to make the meeting, which was a horrific flight. Uh, flights, I will tell you. Wayne left at three o'clock in the morning uh, to get back for that council meeting, but I stayed on in Malta. And, and represented us. Uh, thank you very much for representing the city of Millbury at M Malta with the president and the uh, and the mayor of Malta. Thank you very much. And the U.S. Embassy. It was really it was an, uh, an amazing trip. Um, but uh, what was I say? Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, you were excused. You were marked as excused. So um, I just had people call me and say, "What happened? Where were you?" Oh. So, yeah. The reason I bring it up is I had a number of people call me saying, "And what happened? Why weren't you there?" Oh. So it's nice when we are excused on city business to say that we're actually on city business. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so can I have your votes? Or somebody want a motion approval for the minutes? Okay, let me take votes, please. Oh, is this both? Yes. Oh. Is that okay? You want to take a separate? Second minute. Yeah. Well, okay. The second meeting. So. Yeah, first one. Oh, you can. You okay? Well, let me just do the first one. Is that okay? People taking the motion. Yeah. Okay. So we're voting for this first, um, first, ninth, April ninth minutes. Okay, votes, please. The minutes for the regular meeting from April 9th passed with a vote uh, four to zero. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, um, so let's take uh, someone motion for approval of uh, April twenty third, please. Okay, the votes, please. Uh, uh, yes, modify. Thank you. The minutes from the regular meeting of April 23rd passed with a vote of three to one with Council Member Schneider abstaining. And Councilwoman Schneider was excused for that day. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, so on oral, there's no oral reports, and now we're coming to public communication. This is an opportunity for anybody who, in the public who would like to speak on something that's not on the agenda, does not represent the views of the city, um, and you have three minutes um, to my discretion. Um, and if you start seeing that yellow light, that means you have 30 seconds. Uh, so is anybody like to is there, is have two speaker slips? Okay. Neri, did you guys want to speak tonight or you want to come up? You, you, don't you want to do it now or? Okay, good, all right. Come on up and then do me a favor and fill out a speaker slip for later. Okay, um, we had slides prepared, but um, I guess that didn't go on the, um, what do you call, on the agenda. So I guess we'll just do it off our phones. Um, so we're here, we go to Mills High School, and w as a part of our environmental science class, we have to do this um, impact project, and we decided pretty late on that we wanted to ban plastic, try to get legislation to ban plastic straws in the city of Millbury. And part of our um, data, as you can say, was to go to Millbury businesses and uh, talk to them about the new law that the state of California had passed that sit in restaurants can't provide plastic straws and they actually need to, the customer needs to ask for a plastic straw to uh, to get one, 
but that didn't apply to like Starbucks, Pete's, like uh, just not s- sit in restaurants per se. And we just went around serving actual sit in restaurants and non sit in restaurants such as Starbucks. And uh, we found that we found mixed results with some saying that they would um, like to move forward and uh, provide reusable options. And for example, Bamboo sells uh, reusables and Starbucks is planning to go to like a sippy cup type of thing. It's weird because some drinks like Frappuccinos, you can't really drink without a straw. So um, yeah, that's what our research was. Can I pass it on to them? Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Vanessa Lee, and I am a student of Mills High School as well. Um, Now, why do we want to ban plastic straws? Um, One of the sole reasons why we want to ban plastic straws is because they are the eighth most found plastic waste in the ocean, and they make up about 3% of all collected trash in the sea. Um, In addition, plastic straws, why aren't we targeting things like plastic cups or plastic packaging? It's because plastic straws can't be recycled because um, they can't, the type of plastic they're made of, it's called PPE. They, it can be recycled, but because of the way that plastic straws are made, they are so small that they usually pass through all recycling facilities, making it virtually impossible to recycle unless we completely change the infrastructure of current recycling plants. So that is basically impossible. And cutting out plastic straws would greatly reduce plastic waste in the city of Millbury. And we hope that this sort of legislation would sort of branch over to other cities and maybe start a green revolution. Um, As I mentioned before, plastic straws are one of the top killers of sea life. Um, one One of the viral videos that we encountered during our search for this project was a person, a group of marine biologists pulling a plastic straw out of a green sea turtle's nose. Yeah, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that video. We were going to show that to you, but unfortunately we couldn't. And some sustainable alternatives to plastic straws include the very familiar paper straws. Um, You can see certain local businesses taking up paper straws. Um, I know for a fact that Stone Mill Matcha in Valencia Street in San Francisco uses paper straws now. Um, The Millbrae Leo's meeting that happened during this past week, was it? No, like past month. Past month, they were serving, they were also using plastic straws. I mean, they were using paper straws instead of plastic straws and um, a cool other alternative would be the hay straw which is a straw, like it it is what it sounds like, a straw made of hay or a reed. And that is a very sustainable alternative because it takes virtually no processing unlike plastic or paper straws. And unlike paper straws, they don't melt or dissolve in your drinks. And finally, we have reusable straws that are made of things like ceramic, glass, or steel. Um, Those are a great alternative, but Implementing that requires citizens to act on their own behalf in that they need to bring their own straws. They need to remember to clean their straws and bring their straws to restaurants. So we would recommend using either hay straws or paper straws. And I'm going to pass this on to um, my fellow classmate. Um, As Vanessa said, other cities. Your name, name, please. uh, Curtis Pan, Curtis Pan. as Vanessa said, there are, like um, we would we would like to like by approving this legislation, we would like to approve um, incentivize other cities to do so as well to follow along in our steps to ban plastic straws. Um, other cities that have already done so include like Alameda with their Straw Free ad- Initiative, where they have straws upon request already, and they're already incentivizing businesses or encouraging them to switch to biodegradable or compostable straws. Um, another city would be Berkeley, which is close by as well, where the city council already passed an ordinance that requires all takeout cups and utensils to be compostable, just such as, just just like their straws. And by and by uh, starting next year, they would require all disposable cups to cost uh, to cost a quarter each to incenti- to incentivize less waste. 
to wrap it all up, um, the uh, what do you call the city provided us with some um, reusable uh, metal straws, uh, such as uh, Councilwoman Ann Schneider has right now, and uh, we we had an environmental week at Mills, and we raised awareness through um, uh, you can say like survey. Mostly, it was just like you can get answer if you answered the questions correctly. You got one of these, and uh, it, I think it really raised awareness as we were in the middle of the school at lunchtime, and a lot of people found it very uh, cool. And uh, one last note is that uh, the non-sit-in like coffee shops get a get a get um, are the biggest users of plastic straws and they get away with uh, giving plastic straws because they don't technically give it out and you have to walk to the side and actually pick it out. So, yeah, thank you. Council has questions? I think you can ask. Do you guys have any questions? I don't think uh, we're allowed to because of public comment, but. Oh, okay, um, thank you. I, I guess we can't ask questions. Can can I say something no. not related? Not related? Somewhat side okay. not related. Um, at the mayor's initiative, we've had two meetings with uh, high school and college students on climate change actions and other environmental actions. So we're working through that process of creating um, student activists on environmental issues. So I think we have an avenue to bring items forward to us that come from young people. That's going to give a round of applause for your presentation. <laughs> okay, I, I think it's uh, worthwhile, something that uh, we can direct staff into looking into, um, and I think it's something that uh, it's, it's going to happen in the future, and it'd be awesome if Millbury was the forefront as when the Mayor, uh, mayor Gina Pappen uh, uh, pushed forward for uh, re, re, uh, um, getting rid of those re plastic uh, containers and plastic bags. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, next uh, speaker, and thanks again for coming and uh, for your presentation. We'll keep in touch with you. Oh, if you could just fill out a speaker slip for the record, that'd be great. You know, just one of these gray things that uh, that uh, Councilman Pappen is about to get for you. So we have uh, Niwa Chen. Alice Kwan, are you guys gonna all speak together? Okay, John Chan and Warren Young. Uh, Margaret Ng and... <laughs> sure, Wayne, can you read that? Oh, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what happens when yeah, you're on the just say, you want to start first? No, yeah. what do I have to do? Okay. Um, Mayor Lee, uh, Vice Mayor Holliver, and Council Member Schneider, and Council Member Pappen. I'm Nian Hua Chen, the Millbury resident, and also the president of Millbury Cultural Community this year. Today, we are here to request our council to agree and to update and standardize the Chinese name for Millbury. Um, we know the meaning of Millbury, that is the estate became known as Millbury, from mills and uh, the Scottish word bray, which means rolling hills and a hill slope. But current Chinese name for Millbrae is just a phonetic translation and does not have any specific meaning. Moreover, we noticed that um, there are various translations appeared in the Chinese media and in the Mil Millbrae city government publications, such as here, that are um, Mayor, Mayor Lee's business card shows um, Mayor Bure, and our city manager's uh, business card show Mayor Bure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all in different in Chinese uh, letters. So, um, so many people uh, voiced the opinion that this translation, this translated names, are not easy to pronounce and do not represent the meaning of Millbury. And so suggested to have um, one standard Chinese name for Millbury. Um, that 
we want a name that can um, be meaningful and easy to remember and closer to the English pronunciation. So for this reason, the Millbury Culture Committee would like to assist in the process of collecting the suggestions and uh, for this uh, new standard translation. And so far we have received about 14 responses. And then uh, we, we, we expect more will come in. So um, by the end of this May, um, this month, then we will give all the submittals to council and the city. And we want to give the headache to you. <laughs> so, um, and then so your support and um, to, you know, your support to help update and standardize the Chinese name for Millbury uh, will be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Warren, did you want to still speak, Warren? Or? Margaret? I'm going to add one more thing. Our city manager, Mr. Williams, he sent out a great survey just a couple months ago along with Marcos, um, our consultant, to try to engage the Chinese speaking merchants and also the commercial building property builders, I mean the commercial property owners. Um, in, that, in that Chinese survey, the name is again different from what was printed on Mr. Williams' business card. And uh, I've seen variation forms, different variation forms of the Chinese name. That's the, and this is one of the reasons why we want to be able to engage uh, Chinese speaking property owners as well as the merchants. So having an official Chinese name for Miu Bay, I think it would be a stepping stone for us to really get our business going in terms of um, getting the um, transformation of a uh, downtown development. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Alice, did you want to say something? Warren? You guys have your speakers. Oh, Sammy. Uh, good evening, Mayor Lee and um, the rest of other members of city council member. Uh, anyway, I'm uh, Warren Young and I'm a Milbury resident. Uh, well, I'm uh, going to be speaking just about the same subject regarding about the Chinese language for the Milbury. Uh, this is like a footnote here. The word of Milbury has only syllabus. However, the culture translated name have four Chinese character. Update Milbury Chinese name should be simpler and sound consists of two Chinese characters that are meaningful, easy to remember, and closer to the English pronunciation. Thank you. And I think that's about the notes that I have. Thank you very much. Okay, Alice, thank, thank you. you. No, I need to um, make that up. That letter uh, is from Sammy Yim right. because he is busy in St. Pono and gives some scholarship. But because he is a uh, uh, commissioner of sister, sister city commission, so he was very strong support and tried to have one unit easy in Chinese spelling name. So right. that's he what he write, but he's not able to present today. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Another word is on behalf of uh, uh, Sammy Yim, Commissioner Sis of Sister City, speak on behalf of him. So, mm -hmm. thank you very much. May I add one more thing? So, Commissioner Yim actually showed me a package that they it was of an official package that is printed by City of Mill Bay. They bring that package to China, and the name on that package is. Again, different from your business card. So this is one of the reasons why we would like to request to standardize the Chinese name of Milbury. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I guess it's equivalent to spelling Milbury four different ways. So Sorry. I think that uh, for branding reasons and some people to recognize the city and uh, understand who we are, we really do need to standardize our name. So can staff uh, maybe work with this uh, MCC, Milbury Culture Committee to, to uh, you know, figure out a way we can engage our community um, and uh, take in, I think MCC's already started a process of taking in names. So what we need to do is uh, figure out a process of officializing uh, a Chinese name. Thank you. Yeah, Thank we'll, you. we'll work with you to correct it and whatever you come up with, then we'll standardize it and bring it to the council. Uh, I just want to try to say those what if we understand what city they're talking about. 
Mia Pouye. Mia Pouye. Mia Pouye. Even I, my primary dialect is Cantonese. Even I cannot say those translations. Even it's more too many different spelling. But like we have some suggestion like um, Mel Bai Li. Really. Um, <laughs> so those can we try to have something can present a city very simple. Even Tom can write it and pronounce it. That's what our common goal. Yeah. Thank you. Alice, Alice volunteered to teach me Chinese, so uh -huh. I'm going to take her up on that uh, offer. I think, by the I think way. also, if uh, depending on your dialect, it can also sound differently too, because the characters yeah. will be the same. But it, in, in if depending on our dialect, it would be pronounced differently, too. So that's another complication. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that up to our attention. Um, and staff will work with you to uh, make sure that the city gets what they deserve, a, a proper name. Thank, thank you. you. My name's Alice Kong. He remind me I didn't say my name. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alice. <laughs> thank you. Uh, anybody else for public communications? All right. Um, Let's see. So on to the consent calendar, item five through nine. Um, oh, Alice, yes. You want to make another comment? No, I think it's different. Like, like oh, you want it different? Okay, go ahead, please. Sorry, I, I apologize. I didn't know you had a different uh, subject. Okay. Um, now, as my personal three uh, minutes uh, public speak, I'm Alice Kong. I live in 1085 Clearfield Drive, Milbury. I just uh, clearly um, to request, Milbury has more than 40% residents are uh, Chinese as first language. I would request the city has bilingual in Chinese in all city level public load on MCTV, next door, and important hearing meetings. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Yes, we don't want to make sure we're transparent um, and we also make sure we engage all of our citizens, not just some of them. So um, I guess a con consideration, I think uh, city manager Tom Williams has taken steps with the staff to try to provide more access to our citizens and the different uh, languages. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so on to the consent calendar items. F is anybody, well, okay. Comment? Uh, clear comment, go ahead. Oh, just one comment. Um, on, as far as the public works projects go, um, it's very helpful to the public to see what's happening. So when you, these projects happen, if they can have some sort of signage that the public understands what they're paying for, not necessarily the price tag, but letting them know what it's about is extremely important um, and helps people understand where their taxpayer money is going. Oh, did you have a, a comment? Uh, no, just, uh, th that's a great idea and we were, just discussing that this morning, actually. So I yeah, and actually, I agree. I, I, More I saw a sign um, on on Broadway that said something about littering. Um, it was in English and Chinese. So to me, if you really want to get your point across, you put in Chinese. So I don't understand why we don't do other things in Chinese. But w we definitely want to send a signal. We put we write it in bilingually. But for some reason, we don't want to do that for other. You know, Well, there are more than um, two languages spoken. Yeah, that's, that's, agreed. that's agreed. That's uh, agreed. But I think what uh, w the, I think the most cost-effective way is trying to reach the most uh, the the, uh, the largest speaking languages in our city. I do believe the county um, registrar of voters determines which languages come out in the ballots, and that's determined by the population. So. Um, a uh, move approval of items one through nine. Okay. Okay. I mean five through nine. Excuse five through me. nine. Your votes, please. Oh, oops, I want to vote. Okay, thank you. Items five through nine passed with a vote of four to zero. Thank you. And um, <coughs> item eleven's been continued. Uh, okay, so we're on to item twelve again. A recreation Center restoration project. Um, we just had the informational meeting at six o'clock this evening, and so now we are at to accept the report and design concept uh, design concept report. Deanna Hilbrandt, uh, deputy city manager and finance director. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. 
So as you noted, we started this evening with a um, schematic design study session. Um, so for tonight, the action before you is to consider approval of the Mumbai Recreation Center conceptual design report. This was brought to you about a month ago. It was a very large document. Many of those items had been seen before by council, but perhaps in different formats or in summarized formats. So we wanted to give you some time to take a look and um, reconsider approval at this time. So that is the, the action for you this evening. Um, in terms of the update, the updates are primarily financial, just to keep you posted. We've been working, continuing to work very hard, as always, on the funding options for the Recreation Center. So we've summarized for you the funding in hand, as well as commitments, so funds that aren't in our hands at the moment, but are committed to the project. Um, so that is a number about $12.5 million. The difference we're looking at through a combination of sources, including surplus property sales, capital contributions, especially towards a preschool, but other con contribution options, um, and development impact fees. So we're looking, we're working with the county on the possibility of a short-term loan. We discussed that at the last update about a month ago, and the there was a question around what that might cost us. So in the attachment to the staff report, we've given you a bit of analysis. The purpose for looking at this type of financing is because construction escalation, is, besides that we need this resource for the community, is construction escalation is significant. So really by saving even one year of getting this project built, you save enough money to cover some borrowing costs. So um, besides, again, that you give the community this great and necessary resource. So um, we wanted to share that with you. Um, and then separately, besides all of the work to fund the new recreation center, we are also continuing to work with the insurance company. What they call the period of loss ends after three years. So in July, that period of loss will end. Um, we've been recovering costs of what we call extra expenses, for example, um, project management services, extra porta potties, fencing, um, that will stop um, after three years. Um, we've been working on the costs of, um, of um, the modular, and that's been finalized and accepted. And so um, they'll bring, they'll return those funds that were spent by the city that will be returned to the city. Um, most of those funds were spent from what they call prior proof of loss funds that were already submitted. Um, we just need to, re to recover those towards the settlement funds. Um, and finally, we are also working on uh, business and personal property loss. So as we've purchased items that were lost in the fire, um, those have been recovered and we've, um, and uh, to a cap that they've set through an inventory and the loss of revenue uh, due to the loss of the larger facility. Um, so we just wanted to give you those updates and we are focusing now, we've received two responses to the request for statements of interest for a preschool operator. We'll be interviewing them in the coming weeks. Um, again, one of the things to discuss is their ability to make a capital contribution, what, what operations look like for them. We have a number of questions set out um, and we'll continue to update you on that as we go forward. And we'll be looking also at what some of our neighboring agencies have done in terms of capital financing um, through uh, foundations or purchase of tiles or other, other way, uh, room naming, that type of thing. So we're looking at some of those policies as models. So if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Yes. Councilwoman Snyder. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for the staff report. It, I appreciate the detail in it. I appreciate the breaking out of the revenues or the insurance payments and things like that. I think that will help if the public will take the time to read the staff reports. It'll help them understand what the city is doing. So thank you. With that, I have a couple of questions. Um, we didn't get the grant and it didn't say why. And I'm just curious because the title of that grant was Cultural, Community, and Natural Resources, but did they give us any feedback why we didn't um, move it on to the next level of that? There were, there were two, p two pieces of information as I understood them. One, there were just a huge number of applicants. So very, very competitive. Yes, and secondly, my understanding is that income level was a more significant criteria than in the next grant application, so average income for the area. So in the next grant application, there's two, there's a different way of looking at that criteria that it makes us, uh, um, improves our application, our points in okay. that system. Well, so we're okay. happily moving forward. We have a great package that started for the next project, for the okay. next grant due in August. 
So the reason I was kind of hoping maybe it was, wow, you didn't have enough natural resources. I'm still going to say when we approve or when we're when I'm being asked to approve the full packet, where you look at the bioswale that we talked about in the study session, and we're going to be grading the ground, it's an opportunity to think about, and I'm forgetting the right word, the underground tanks that store storm water so we don't have sewage overflows or uh, storm water overflows into the bay. It's an opportunity to put a tank under there as a containment basin, I know it would cost more, but perhaps there's some green infrastructure funding we can get for that aspect of the project. And I just don't want to lose sight of it because my understanding is our heaviest overflow on bad rain days is coming down Tioga, and it's not that difficult to shift that water. Well, okay, it's a little difficult. Okay, it's a lot difficult to bring it from Tioga or down the hillside from Clearview and get that water down so that it doesn't end up in our neighborhoods that would flood. So I just want to keep that idea out there. That's not going to stop me from voting and approving what you're asking tonight. And then my third question, you said we've got two RF requests for interest or something. So, so we, we, we put forward a request for statement of interest. We had two statement responses to that request. So I know that Supervisor Carol Groom has talked about county funding to help grow more preschools. So hopefully we've tapped into that grant source. We, we would be looking towards the county as an alternative as well. And they have already contributed uh, uh, about $750,000 just to our project in general without the child care option being part of it. So right. So if the child care option is part of it, hopefully that's another source of funding. Yeah. Thank you. Councilman Pappen. Again, thank you for the report and all the hard work. Um, I think we are totally committed to... Um, saving money by trying to get this done um, in an appropriate and um, expedited manner. So thank you very much. Uh, additional areas of um, potential funding, uh, the City and County Association of Governments does have funding for, as Ms. Schneider suggested, some of these um, water uh, issues along those lines, so we should really reach out to them as well. Um, corporate sponsors for the um, either naming rights or um, the child care services, and as Ms. Schneider was suggesting, uh, the county has a separate fund of money, separate fund for um, child care and um, preschool programs, that type of um, activity that are all along all those lines. And I would hope that as we move forward, um, private fundraising as some of the council members committed to when we went for a higher project, uh, when that starts and how we as a community go about that um, and setting up a committee probably since elected members are really these days prohibited from seeking funds under new FPPC regulations. Uh, so as we progress along those lines, uh, appreciate all the efforts that are being made and staff's efforts to get new grant money as well. So thank you. Thank you. So um, thank you for all this. Now with the potential loan from the county, it mentions here that funding would not be needed until mid to late 2021. Um, but I would imagine that we would need to have that agreement uh, finalized well before that, um, <laughs> before we move on other uh, parts of the, the timeline here. Um, and when do we think that is uh, at this time? I think we're targeting the timing of the development projects that are producing the impact, the most of the potential impact fees. And so as those projects are moving forward and we understand the timing of those potential development impact fees to help us work with the county in terms of timing for um, repayment. So as they're pulling building permits or before that or after that? Well, I think two things. One answer to your question, I think between now and the end of this year, um, hopefully we'll have a, a loan agreement in place with the county. Um, as we've mentioned, collateralizing the develop future development impact fees that are collected. Um, and then 
the, the issue that we have is, is not necessarily funding, it's when we get that funding. Mm -hmm. And so the county loan will help bridge the, the short-term gap. And so we, you know, depending on the absorption and the rate of which the building permits are pulled for each of the projects is dependent upon our flow of funds to, to repay that. But we think um, somewhere between the next, you know, three to seven years, we will have TOD1 and TOD2 development impact fees um, collected as well as some of the other projects that are outside of the specific planning area that we're working on development impact fees and, and believe that um, we will have sufficient funds to, to uh, pay that county loan back. And I, I think that, <clears throat> you know, we're looking at 14 million, but as we look at the surplus properties planning, I think it closes the end of this week in terms of what the law requires us to um, offer those two parcels to other governmental uh, entities. So as we get other sources of funds in, corporate funding, depending on how we, you know, discuss um, uh, with the two, two entities that are interested in the preschool program, I think that we can, you know, it may be not 14, maybe it's 12, maybe it's 11, but as we get closer, um, we can solidify where we are with that. But um, the, the county's been fantastic. The chief executive uh, over at the county's just been a, a pleasure to work with on this. So um, they are, you know, ready, willing, and able to help us. Okay, very good. And, and I would also suggest that if we are in the process also of um, potentially developing city-owned property around the uh, transit center, um, that perhaps as part of that RFQ, RFP process, um, potentially there could be a, a community benefits component to it, which could include um, rec center funding beyond whatever fees, beyond whatever impact fees would be uh, paid by the developer. Um, perhaps that's something we could look into as well. Yeah, most certainly, yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Councilwoman Pappen. Um, along those lines, we need to be deeply concerned. Um, I know we have a discussion on SB 50, but SB 330 is even worse and would not allow us to charge any fees that are not currently um, in um, our uh, repertoire. Actually, they cut it off as far as January 1st, 2018. So it's absolutely appalling SB 330, uh, so I hope that we can um, put that on our future agenda item. Well, it would be to it would be totally crippling to jurisdictions like ours. Any other questions, comments? I I do. Um, I, I, I'm really concerned, and I want to say that I'm concerned about the uh, safety of seniors being on the second floor. If there was a fire, uh, how I no, but this is all part of the design for this building, right? Yeah, we're, 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 we're looking no, at that. I don't. No, we're not. <laughs> I think we're still looking at the conceptual design. So council is uh, adopting a conceptual design report. Um, the presentation is still here, and there is there are some um, kind of at the end slides around that. So um, taking these from Andrea, so I, I, uh, she probably could give better detail, but this is the type of thing that could happen during an evacuation. So they talked about those stairwells that have the, the safe point and the evacuation chairs. Um, and also during normal day to day, um, of course an elevator, and if for some reason an elevator is out of service, which is not common, programs can move downstairs. Um, there's also the acoustic issues. Um, and just a more quiet and calm place for them to be um, and having the benefit of the balcony and the nice um, lighter spaces. Vice Mayor. Yeah, and, and also, you know, this is a similar issue with any, um, you know, multi-story senior housing project like the Magnolia of Millbury, like the Green Hills Retirement Center. They all have multiple floors. They all depend on uh, elevators. Obviously, yeah, there could be times when elevators are out of service, but you know, the, the solution isn't to have all, you know, senior housing and senior programming on, on the ground floor. 
Um, yeah, I think this is so a different. I disagree. This with is a totally different type I think of project. We're beyond that. No, I think this is a different type of project because now we're not talking about building a, a residential unit. We're talking about providing recreation units for seniors and uh, other communities, and we do have a choice of where those uh, those senior programs are placed. But I understand the underst you know the desire to have separation between the seniors and the uh, uh, youth programs, and I understand that the want. Uh, desire to have the youth programs on the bottom floor um, and, it's, and the seniors being isolated from the rest of the community uh, activities. But um, like I said, I still am concerned about the, um, the, the fire uh, issues and safety issue of egress. So that's just my comment. Um, also, uh, what I discussed about the, uh, the amphitheater sort of approach, the dual use of the stage, um, that could still be considered, or is that? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, as a result of the study session, Group 4 said that they would go back and they would take a look to see if there's any type of a, a platform or a design over the bioswale that, that could extend that out, and then also a redesign of the, of the outdoor um, deck to actually increase that and make it larger. Th those are the two things from the study session that we took away that group four will will bring back at the next study session. Okay, any other questions, comments? Councilwoman Happen. Um, we also noted uh, in-ground posting that can be covered. Should we be able to put up umbrellas or anything like that in the future? And I will note for the mayor that we are not um, you know, just, it's a durable building. We can change things in the future should they not work out. Um, should the seniors decide they're uncomfortable, whatever. I mean, we have to, the building um, will be a benefit to the entire community and it's a workable building. So we can modify where programs go in the future. We just need to get there and <laughs> get this built. So uh, I, I understand the mayor's concerns, but um, I think they're exceptionally, um, Premature at this point in time. I hope that we can get to uh, a workable, usable building uh, that all of us can be proud of. Uh, so again, there's a space of refuge, um, uh, the, the stairs that was talked about earlier, and also some of the amenities on the second floor. So in the prior discussions with the senior groups, it's my understanding that many of them really like the idea. They really like the balcony um, that was available to mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. the quietness of, of being in that um, more moderate activity space. So what will be upstairs as well as art space and, and classrooms. Um, so uh, you know a little bit less likelihood of maybe being run into or something like that. Okay, but I think we should say that we consider that uh, the safety issue. Um, also, it, what's the, what's, it's the kitchens on the bottom floor. So if, if they wanna, so. There's a kitchenette in that area. In that area, where is that? So I saw it in one of the slides. Senior lounge and kitchenette, so probably you know to be able to make coffee type of things will be in that area. Uh, as before, okay. So, but if we want to do like food serving on, on the top floors, then you have to slap it up the stairs, or is there a dumb waiter, or how is that? The elevator. How's that handle? Elevator. Elevator. Okay. Okay. Anybody I mean, else? if there were a large event, for example, like self help for the elderly, would more likely use a larger space like the community room. I, I, this, I don't think this is a huge space that would accommodate something like that program. This is, I think, meant to be more of a quiet space. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Mayor, I would just agree. I was not overly comfortable with the senior center on the second floor. But at this point, hopefully we will have plenty of drills. We'll have a safety plan. We'll make sure that the seniors are included in this. And it might also be a good opportunity to bring in our, our CERT team who will be the people called in to help if they're around quickly. So I think we, we're gonna be doing a lot in the city. We're gonna be doing a lot all over California now after all of the fires in more um, get ready exercises, uh, more city evacuation drills, uh, things like that. Um, so I, I think we're coming into a new normal and your concern is, is valid. But I think there's ways that we can train people up and they made me can feel like I could get, my mom would get down, your mom would get down. They'd have enough access to be able to get people with mobility issues to get down quickly. 
And they've actually measured that it would be closer than the previous center in terms of walking to the elevator and going upstairs and going to the lounge. So they've done that kind of analysis as well. Councilman Papin. Um, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just want to reiterate here, we're backtracking. The seniors were an active participant in all the preliminary meetings, um, and there was not the objection that's being shown tonight by the council members. Um, and I will emphasize that, again, it's a flexible building. Uh, we can work within it, and it's an exciting opportunity here. So to second guess at this point in time, uh, I think we are getting beyond ourselves here. Uh, one of the primary businesses here is the Safeway, which is a second a, um, platform store, which seems to do quite well. Uh, if anything, um, we're working towards um, an amazing structure. So I hope we can stay focused on that because we've had the community meetings and the um, response has been uh, very, very positive for all age groups and all um, interest groups. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyway, I am. Uh, I have already just made my peace of mind. I just want to let you know. So I'm. I'm clear conscience. I said what I had to say. So I'm moving on, and I'm hoping everybody else is going to move on too. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> anything else? Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? And thank you, staff, for uh, shepherding us through the report. Item number 12 passed with a vote of four to zero. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, last item, uh, new business review and affirming the city's position regarding opposition to Senate Bill 50, Wiener's, uh, Scott Wiener's bill. And then staff, do we have a report, please? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, again, Tom Williams, City Manager. So very briefly, uh, Senate Bill 50, SB 50, uh, that was introduced by State Senator uh, Wiener. We believe, as professional staff, it's an ill-advised attempt to force high-density housing within local communities, um, kind of turning upside down the history of zoning and land use authority given to local jurisdictions. Uh, it uh, has negative consequences that are found in the staff report and throughout the letter. Um, municipalities from San Francisco to Los Angeles have opposed uh, Senate Bill 50. Um, because of the issues uh, that I just mentioned, that uh, high density housing by right in areas that um, uh, eliminates due process at the local level, um, even though we all believe that uh, more housing is important and affordable housing is important in our community, um, we just as staff would recommend that the council adopt the letter as our formal position. Uh, there are other issues, uh, for example, Counties like Marin, counties like Santa Cruz are exempt from this bill. Um, any county that has a population of less than 400,000. Uh, 600. Excuse me, 600,000 is exempt. Um, the, um, th there are issues that, you know, with my experience over the years, I, I do believe that it is uh, in an in a odd and ironic way an anti-transit bill um, due to the fact that um, uh, cities that, that would be subject to SB 50 or within a quarter mile, a half mile of a transit area. I've personally experienced cities that, uh, for example, uh, light rail, um, other modes of public transportation, um, you know, come out and, and oppose uh, public transportation. I think this would add to the reason why cities would, would oppose um, transportation if they were subject to SB 50. And so there are many flaws and I, I see that there are questions of the council. So in brief summary, I'd be happy to answer questions and, and provide our staff opinion. Councilman Papin. Uh, yes, this has been quite a topic of discussion. Um, cities throughout San Mateo County uh, have opposed this strongly so. The legislation does not consider intermodal centers such as Milbrae has, transit, um, uh, programs or plans that various cities throughout our community have had. Um, Mr. Senator Weiner has basically sold part of the bill off to richer, shall we say, um, communities by exempting uh, the regulations for 
uh, counties under 600,000. Uh, it's contradictory to the efforts that counties have made, like San Mateo County, we're reaching close to a million residents. So we're almost being penalized for the amount of housing that we are providing. Uh, it removes zoning from local jurisdictions uh, without any um, data-based information. Senator Weiner has been to our county. We have provided data, housing for all, uh, the Housing Endowment Regional Trust, all of which has been completely ignored by the Senator. The county uh, supervisors in San Francisco and the San Francisco Planning Commission have also uh, opposed this legislation. Keep in mind, this is not going to provide affordable housing. It is just going to take away local jurisdictions zoning and that is really critical to our financial sustainability. Uh, the aspects of San Mateo County, 68% of this county is open space, and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, you will be negatively impacted. We all will be negatively impacted. San Francisco has 70,000 housing units coming online, none of which are affordable. So if this was the Senator's goal, it's not the appropriate means of providing affordable housing. Our cities, the 20 cities in San Mateo County and towns are providing affordable housing. Our general plan or our station plan requires 15%. The development at BART is over 20% and we are continuing to do our best to provide affordable housing. This is a free ride for developers, that's all it is here. And in addition to the 70,000 units coming online in San Francisco, 30,000 of their rent control units are vacant. So this is not the answer, and I hope we will all join the opposition in this realm. Councilman Snyder. A great letter, uh, and to the public, if again, you're curious why cities have to do what we have to do, please read the staff report and read the letter. Um, my comments are more that I don't remember what the CC was. Are we making sure that we're looping in Assemblyman Mullen and Senator Hill? The, the letter's already been sent to our represent, state representative. Okay, so they know about it, as well as um, Assemblyman Ting, Okay. And the Appropriations Committee, which heard the bill today, but deferred it to uh, Great. hopefully purgatory well, on Thursday. Well done. I, I liked all the points that you brought up, and I think you did it in a, in a very specific and respectful way. So thank you. I mean, I, I don't know if it would be helpful to read kind of the eight primary reasons um, yeah, you know, the bill and, and reiterate those. But I would like to thank also uh, Council Member Holliber and, um, and Council Member Pappin. They, they were instrumental also in in um, drafting the language. So number one, SB 50 is not data driven and fails to recognize the progress in housing development in each particular community. Number two, SB 50 fails to recognize the unique characteristics of communities. Number three, SB 50 is an anti-transit bill that would deter the expansion of public transportation in communities currently not served by transit within a one half mile or one quarter mile of a major transit stop. Number five, SB 50 fails to recognize the fiscal impacts on local municipalities and it does not allow for adequate funding to serve the needs of the new residential population on local communities. SB 50 prevents cities from setting reasonable parking requirements. SB 50 penalizes communities and counties with populations over 600,000 and fails to recognize the jobs housing balance in each community. SB 50 primarily benefits developers and could actually increase the cost of housing for lower and middle income residents. And lastly, SB 50 places an undue burden on communities that are building their fair share of housing and meeting their regional housing needs assessment known as RENA goals. For example, the city of Millbrae, based on the um, TOD1 and TOD2 um, uh, approvals, uh, we more than exceed not only our overall housing goal uh, for 2023, but also our um, affordable housing requirement and, and the bill fails to recognize that progress. 
Can I ask that it go to also the governor's office, the Metropolitan Transportation Committee, the League of Cities, CCAG, ABAG, uh, and um, what are we missing? As many people as possible. Uh, you can see that the mayors of um, uh, Burlingame listed a whole bunch of others too. So, the yeah, all the co-sponsors on SB 50. That would be great. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yeah, and I'd also like to state that you know our opposition to this bill is not an opposition to housing. It's it's really an opposition to the loss of process and planning around housing and how to do it right. Um, I think you know there. Are, I think we all agree that having density around transit is a positive thing. Um, but you know when we crafted our stationary specific plan, we were careful to not increase density everywhere, such as in the um, Bayside Manor neighborhood, uh, which would be severely impacted by this bill. Um, I think also the lack of parking is a very uh, significant impact, uh, especially around, around transit centers. It does not, uh, it prohibits any parking requirement at all. So, um, you know, while I think uh, incentivizing transit and active transportation is a positive thing and something we try to do, uh, it's simply not reasonable to assume that nobody at all coming into a community will have a car, uh, as much as we would like to think that's possible. Um, so that's only going to exacerbate parking problems in our residential neighborhoods. Um, you know, as city council members, it's we we really don't want it to be our job to stick our neck into legislation at the state level. But um, really, at least in my time on council, I don't think any issue has drawn this much ire among. Uh, the uh, elected officials throughout San Mateo County. And uh, I just really hope that our state legislators, uh, our delegation is listening to our very serious concerns. Councilman Schneider. The next ABAG General Assembly, not that a great deal happens to them, is in June. And whereas I'm gonna miss the next council meeting, if there's instructions that you need for me to do at that meeting, please make sure that you process them and let me know. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I am on the executive board of Associated Bay Area Governments, and uh, Councilman Gina Pappen is on the uh, MCT, MCT, MCT Commission, the Mich Metropolitan Transportation Commission. So both of us holding very, uh, very influential and uh, important um, committees, uh, the regional committees. We are both um, working hard to make sure that our cities, especially Millbrae, is uh, represented um, and that our concerns are addressed. Um, and again, we are not, we are for housing. We just approved two large units um, and we're trying to get more uh, and we're trying to get more affordable housing because that's what we really need, affordable housing. Um, and, but we also don't want uh, somebody coming in here who has no accountability to the citizens of that city to come in and tell the, tell us where they want to put their building, how they want to put their building, then they can tell us, they, you know, just just sign the, on the dotted line, um, shut up and just sign the dotted line, and we're going to put in the most ugliest building or we're going to put in the most inaccessible building that we want, and uh, we don't care if your neighbors have the shadows casting over their houses. We don't care if, if uh, any new residents are hanging over their balconies over your neighborhoods. We don't care because we have a housing crisis, but we want to build market rate housing to solve that problem. And I have an issue with developers coming in here and using the housing crisis as an excuse to uh, take off all of, the, all of the local controls to try to build as much as they can and want to. This is a land grab, nothing short of that is a land grab. So um, if I have, I have one motion, do I have a second motion? Okay, can I have your votes, please? <laughs> oh, let's recycle there. There we go. Oh, yeah, it's Christmas. <laughs> okay, we, we <laughs> okay, clear the board, clear the board, clear the board. Yeah. Obviously, we need some technical upgrades in our equipment. Okay, let's try it again. Who, se who second it? Yeah. All right. Let's try it again. That was a light, nice show, though. <laughs> that was a cool show. <laughs> Item number 13 passed with a vote of 4 to 0. And, Mr. Mayor, we will, uh, just, just for a point of clarification and direction of the council, we'll jump on the SB 330 um, 
Thank you. Proposed bill as well and, and bring that and generate a letter as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so down to uh, council comments, no closed sessions. Uh, Councilman Snyder, would you like to start? Okay, um, just off the top of the, uh, the Consul General of Japan's luncheon is June 11th, and at Sister Cities, this was mentioned, it's $25. I, um, we've created a new subcommittee under the Emergency Services Council. It's to deal with particulate pollution. Uh, what was noticed in the last two big fires is it seemed like a lot of the pollutant, the, the fire issue, it, it was concentrating up in North County. So uh, Dave Pines, no, Dave Canapa's staff person and Keegren, who also is a councilwoman from Burlingame, has been reaching out to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District to get a staff specialized in here. But here's the problem I see it in terms of air pollution that we have. They said that they have very specific air monitoring devices in San Mateo County, it's down in South County, and the rest of them are more likely near old industrial areas. Wayne, this is an area of, of your specialty, but if you look at where the current monitoring devices are, they're where the, uh, oil refineries are, other really heavy industry. So there's no way to track the kind of particulate matter that's building up in here. For any person that has asthma or COPD, uh, these are the, what we're trying to do is figure out how do we know when to issue an alert and then what kind of safety measures need to be taken into account if you are somebody who is respiratorily impaired. So this is one committee that we're working on it. I think we're gonna get pushback from the Air Quality Board, but uh, uh, the three members of this committee, it's myself, Rico Medina from San Bruno and um, Glenn, uh, Councilman Sylvester from Daly City will keep pushing on that. I'm gonna let, we'll hold off on the bike rodeo. The, um, the county bicycle and pedestrian grants are gonna be released in a couple of weeks, so staff will, is already aware of that and will be working on that. I'm gonna give you a helpful hint since I sit on the CCAG BPAC. It's great to get support letters from uh, Assemblyman Mullen and Senator Hill, everybody does. Depending on the type of grant, the support letters that really work are the community groups that are gonna be working with you for whatever that grant might be. Um, so when we are, gr we actually have modified the form to give more points to show that people who are applying to the grants are really reaching out into their community. Um, the mayor, as I said, created a, a brought together uh, the youth of Millbrae. I wanna thank Ms. Michaud, who's the environmental science uh, AP teacher and the biology teacher from Mills. She brought a good number of students to the first meeting, even though they were actually having their AP environmental science exams that day. Um, so we've got a good group of youth. There's at least one member from the YAC is on that, that group. And they will be working with the city to identify things that they care about and how we can bring it into the pipeline of the city. Uh, community enhancement has met, they, um, they actually have a really fantastic tree uh, presentation about the value of trees, the reasons why we want trees, how it crosses into safety, how it can slow down traffic, how it can it improve community, uh, just, just community in general besides all the environmental attributes, and that it can increase your property values by 10%. So I don't wanna speak for staff on what they're writing on their grant, but you may be seeing something on trees and something that was mentioned earlier on heat islands. The county is doing a study on heat islands right now, so. I, I, that's the direction we're going into. The, um, we saw the results of the art show. Thank you to everybody in Millbrae who participated. It made for a very busy April, but it's great to have the program back and thank you all and please put it on your calendar. I'm not sure exactly when it's gonna be next year, but we will be doing it annually. Um, and then finally, and no one's mentioned this, but hopefully people will be pitching this. We're having our first ever community volunteer work day. This is a subcommittee that the mayor created on creating our first Millbrae community garden. The community garden is gonna be located at the top or at the bottom of Central Park near Palm Avenue, but closer to Richmond. There's sort of a hilly section up there and Public Works has been out there grading it and Parks has been out there working it. Um, 
Kudos to our recreation staff who applied for a grant and got a grant that's covering almost all of the materials that we need. So the way we're building this project is a community project, community coming together to help put together the pre-cut plastic lumber that will be the raised beds and then to wheelbarrow a lot of topsoil. So lighter than our other soil, topsoil up to the beds. It's June 8th from nine to four o'clock. Uh, community groups are welcome, families are welcome. Um, just trying to make this as big an event as we can. We have one little conflict that day. So I'm gonna give a shout out to the Millbrae Lions who do their big, big, uh, pancake feed at St. Dunstan's. This is the pro their fundraiser to bring in money that rate that handles the Sam brr, the Milbray baseball program. So come down to St. Dunstan's, buy your ticket for pancakes, and then come up to the community work day. The Lions did donate $500, so the city will be bringing in lunch. And I hope to see you all on June 8th. June 8th. Oh, June 8th. June 8th. Oh, and I didn't talk about Malta. Okay. Um, we had an absolutely fantastic time with Malta. As was said earlier in the meeting, we met with our sister city of Mosta, which is truly amazing and is about 700 years old. So we have a year or two to collect, can, uh, to catch up. The um, mayor, who's under election, they get elected uh, this month, and believe it or not, their turnout for elections in, in Mosta are 94 to 98%. So it was great that Millbrae hit 74% last November, but we've got a little bit to do to catch up with our sister city. So this is a gift to the city. It's a book about Mosta, and then it's also in Maltese. Now, I like to try learning a few year words when I go to other countries, but I'm going to tell you this is an incredibly difficult language. It's... Um, 60, 80 percent, um, I want to say Arabic, I always forget this word, um, it begins with an S, Semitic, Semitic, and then it's got some Italian, some French, and thankfully everybody speaks English there. We had an absolutely fantastic time, and the Sister City Commission is working on a slideshow and would like to come to a future council people meeting so that the public can see um, how amazing our sister city is. We met with the, the past president. They had just appointed a new president three weeks prior. We have a really great relationship with the past president. Her new mission is working with children on, um, on uh, youth issues, including climate change and um, health and safety for our children. So I think there's some things that our kids can work with with her, but she gave us a couple of books for that. And I don't think... The city of Millbrae, the gift that we gave back to them, it turns out they only had 12 council members because one just got appointed to their assembly, and I don't think the camera can pick it up, but I don't know if we saved one. So here is one. It has a, a 3D photo of the cornice off the church of Mosta, which is the largest church in Malta, and it's got a fabulous story. I know it's getting late. In World War II, the Germans heavily, heavily bombed Malta. The Italians also bombed them, but they had family members there, so the Italian bombs tended to hit all of the prime spots, or at least a good number of them. But in this case, there were 300 people in the church of our sister city, and a German bomb came through the, the, dome. the dome and broke through one little teeny section and pounced off a picture of of Jesus Christ and landed on the floor and did not explode. So they consider that a miracle. It seems pretty much a miracle. It's an amazing church and a beautiful dome. Um, so I will leave this with the city so that when we get that new display case, we have a little bit of, of that gift. I encourage everyone who hasn't been to Malta, even though it takes almost 24 hours by plane flight to get there, um, it's a great place to go. And I've, it was a privilege to get to represent the city there. So thank you. And again, thank you, Councilman Snyder, for representing the city in the, my absence. Um, it's, uh, she also helped lead part of the delegation. And uh, I agree, Malta, I mean, Malta is someplace that everybody should uh, have an opportunity to visit. It's just phenomenally beautiful um, out of the way. And also, just uh, I don't, you mentioned that the Malta, Millbrae is the only American city that has a sister city relationship with any of the cities in Malta. That's um, and it's Malta. And Malsta, and 80% of the residents in the Bay Area are from Malsta. So that kind of makes Millbrae a very special city and our relationship with Malta very special. So thank you. I, I left out one other thing. And another re uh, fun thing that we did is we went and saw the U.S. Embassy there. And the U.S. Embassy 
has the power to green itself. So it's one of the, if not the greenest embassy in the world. It's solar powered, it collects rainwater, it does everything. And we had a great tour there and a, a nice relationship. And we have one request. The US Embassy has one request of Millbrae. Would we please um, friend their Facebook page? <laughs> so it's still on my to-do list. Uh, Mr. Mayor, real, if I may, uh, sure. I could thank our administrative staff every minute of every day, but I'd like to thank Elaine for really getting the gifts and coordinating with uh, um, Tom Dowdy and the photographer that put that together. She did a lot of hard work, and yeah. we don't thank them enough, so, so thanks, thank Elaine, for doing that. Fantastic, fantastic. Yes, I think it's, uh, it was a really, um, it was how many people? 18. 18 people? 18, and then various family members joined us at different times, so quite a crowd, a busload. Yeah, and then our, our city staff really made it special for our sister city, so thank you very much. Councilwoman Pappen. Um, Mr. Mayor, I think you need to be clear, you were there for part of the trip as well. I was there. So, you I, was, know, I met uh, the mayor. You went all the way there, I too. met the mayor, so and I got to. Thank you. I, I, I was uh, honored to be included as a, uh, as a honorary member of the uh, band, Good. which is a big deal, with uh, our, our Councilor General uh, Louis uh, Bala, mm -hmm. who's, uh, he, who spent a lot of time organizing and planning for the trip for us, so thank you, Louis. And sorry, for the record, the city did not pay for any no. expenses. If no, I paid for it myself. I didn't get permission from the city. All, all of us paid <laughs> our own way, yeah. So, yeah, Great. thank you. Thank you for your okay. clarification. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, several items. Uh, this coming Monday, May 20th, uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Committee has their Expand Horizon program at the San Mateo Library. So if anybody's around, please pop in. They're planning for the future, and we need to let them know our thoughts on the future, particularly from this region. Along those lines, as the new city and town representative or for um, the 20 cities in San Mateo County, we're going to be doing a bus tour of San Mateo County, showing the commissioners and the committee staff uh, everything that is happening within our region, all of our housing production, all of our transportation issues, and really getting them to know why San Mateo County and the cities therein are so amazing. Um, some people have a misrepresentation. They only know San Jose and San Francisco and forget that the San Francisco International Airport is in our backyard and the impact that that has on our region as far as jobs and housing and everything else. So we are looking forward to working with that. I appreciate the city manager's help in coordinating all the city managers and getting that going, uh, as well as the Redwood City Chamber. Roseanne Faust is helping us get sponsors for that. Uh, along Ms. Schneider's uh, line of thinking, the uh, Congestion Management Environmental Quality Group, known as CMAC, uh, is going to be distributing or testing out new monitoring devices for air quality uh, through, I believe, the Metropolitan Transportation Committee as well, funding, so hopefully we'll get along those lines. Uh, I spent way too many hours last Friday in the Metropolitan Transportation Committee's ledge meeting. Uh, sadly, the representatives there um, lack a regional approach when it comes to what appears to be 200 pieces of legislation on housing that's going to impact us. Instead of being inclusory, they seem to be headed towards being divisive when it comes to this type of legislation. And we will continue to try to represent our region's position on these pieces of legislation that are being proposed by the legislature. The Transportation Commission needs to be focused on transportation first and foremost. As we are trying to do, we have to get people to and from, and that is one of the key aspects of this community. When economies transition or go in a downturn, that's the most important aspect and we need to stay focused on that, most importantly here in our region. Uh, I believe Lomita Park is having their barbecue this Friday, five to six. You can still make the movie in the park in Millbrae, so please check that out as well. 
Uh, the Oakland Greek Church is having their festival this weekend, as well as you can actually view, I believe, the Mormon Church before it is dedicated and then closed to the public. They are right next door to one another. The Greek Church in Oakland was a Frank Lloyd Wright design, and they do a wonderful Greek festival. I believe that's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so I encourage anyone who's in the region to attend that. And let's see what else. Um, oh, I attended Stronger Together, a community gathering of hope and healing at the Jewish Community Foundation our, um, uh, location in Foster City with all the um, incidents that are happening throughout the world. This is really a time for all communities to come together in hope and healing. So it was a wonderful event. Uh, I believe I might have mentioned this before, but Milbrae, a business in Milbrae was mentioned in the New York Times. And um, this is an entrepreneur who has a uh, care coach. Uh, and, then, and the individual's name is Victor Wang, the founder and executive chief in Milbrae, California. I believe it's on top of uh, a massage in, uh, business here in Millbury, but um, the individual is partnering with many healthcare providers in that everybody needs to talk to somebody and interact with somebody. So they have a wide-eyed cat that interacts with you. There is a real person on the other side of the cat to help people through difficult times. They've actually prevented different individuals from committing suicide. Um, and just, it's nice to talk to somebody. So this business, Care Coach, is doing quite well and was written up in the New York Times. We congratulate that entrepreneur. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'd also, I don't know if you have your list of closing and memory of, but um, we, I don't know, if, I'm sorry, who's on your list, but uh, longtime Millbury resident uh, Zelda Ruttenberg passed away. So to her children, Ron, Michael, and Donna, and their families, we offer our condolences. And um, Congresswoman Ellen Tauscher unexpectedly passed away. Uh, pneumonia seems to be getting a lot of people these days, as I guess Doris Day also passed away. So please, everyone, take care of yourself and um, I would appreciate if you add those names to your list. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor. Okay, um, I attended the Sister Cities Commission meeting and um, Councilman Schneider and Chair Gottschalk and some of the other members who had gone on the Malta trip gave a good update about uh, everything that happened on that trip, <laughs> as we have heard again tonight. Um, the commission is also working with uh, so somebody who will help uh, modernize the, the website, uh, which has been, a, I think, sort of a 90s era uh, website for, for, for far too long, but um, that will be soon be modernized and have a lot of photos and other um, information about the Sister Cities Commission. Um, so Councilman Pappen and I participated in uh, Bike to Work Day last week. Oh, okay. um, there was, uh, like there, uh, so I'd like to thank, um, Shelly Ryder and our engineering staff that were was present. Uh, also, uh, John Ford from Kimit.org stopped by, um, formerly of the Millbury um, Chamber of Commerce. And um, it was a, a great event and a, a lot of people I saw on, on bicycles that day, so a good way to get to work. Um, the MCTV hosted its trivia night last week on Thursday as well. And uh, there were about nine teams that participated. The, the winning team had um, uh, a number of individuals I had never seen before. So <laughs> I, have a feel, I have a feeling they, they, they were not Millbrae residents, but um, there was a Millbrae trivia round. And even despite not doing well in that round, they ended up winning the whole thing. So congratulations to that team. Millbrae Lions came in second place, uh, had a very strong uh, showing as well. Um, and I think that's all that I have for tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, would Chief Conkle, can you come up, please?
The city manager Williams already talked about the bike rodeo, but I wanna give a special thanks to Chief and your staff um, in the back too. Um, really and truly, I, I think the patch article is gonna come out and say it was up to me, but really and truly, we had a phenomenal bike rodeo, over 300 or so helmets, um, 600 or so people. It was, if you saw the safety course, you would have seen kids on tricycles, kids on scooters, kids on bikes, older kids on bikes. Um, the Sheriff's Activity League kids were there. They ran a bounce house that we ran until four o'clock. I, I mean, it was the very last thing to come down out of the parking lot. And we've got two CERT representatives here, and I know that the CERT chair that day came up and told me for the first, not the first time, but this time they had more people come to their CERT booth and say, we wanna sign up to become CERT trained than has ever happened before. So I just wanna give a huge shout out to our chief, Paul Kunkel, for an amazing job. Really and truly, I mean, the fire part, we, we've got a few lessons to learn, but it, it came together, but it really was all you. And I thank you greatly. Well, thank you, and I uh, appreciate your kind words. And I would like to thank the people that assisted. It was a great collaborative effort, collaborative effort great community uh, engagement effort. And we're hoping to move forward. So at the second weekend, or second Saturday of every May, we have a Millbury Bike Radio. So thank you for your leadership in this, and we appreciate the city's ongoing support. Great. Uh, can we, I think we also have to thank the California Highway Patrol. Yeah, we had a whole bunch of partners. California Highway Patrol, uh, Central County Fire, um, Obviously, the city, the city recreation staff, DPW, was vital in providing the cones, the A-frames, uh, the Sheriff's Activities League, the Sheriff's Office School Resource Unit, the Sheriff's Office uh, um, Community Policing Unit, uh, our, our Police Bureau. Uh, we pulled in people from transit. Sam Trans sent a bus up so people could learn how to put their bike on a bus. Uh, that was educated. That was good. That was educated. No, we tried to make it as inclusive as possible, and it was a really neat adventure getting through in the six months of planning, and it really paid off with a great event. And I was very happy to be a part of it. Um, and I need for that article the name of the disc jockey. So the added icing on the cake, which happened because of your PR person or your PIO, she brought the disc jockey in, and that just added a whole other layer. You could see kids out there dancing. It was it was fun. I absolutely concur. It's not really a party without music, so I can get that to you. I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. Chief, should we uh, introduce Valerie? Because I don't know if she's been introduced to the council, and she does such a great job. Back there. She's back She's back there, but we need to recognize Valerie in the chief. Valerie office. Barnes is the, uh, she's the legal office specialist for the county. That's her title there. Here, she's the uh, assistant to the chief of police. Uh, she's done a tremendous job. Uh, it was a interesting process getting her here, but the city of Millbrae is much better served because of her and our police bureau would not be able to achieve the things it's achieving without her and her hard work. So we're all very appreciative of Valerie. We also gave away five bicycles. I think four have gotten to their new owners. We're still tracking down the, the fifth person. Oh, the fifth one went out this morning. Six. Oh, oh th six? Five. We had five and the last one went out this morning to a very happy preschooler. Excellent, excellent. Um, and I mean, there were just so many bells and whistles on this and I was forgetting, um, oh well. Anyway, hats, hands off, hats off on this and we'll do the, um, the debriefing soon. Did I mention Millbrae Leos? A lot of face painting. Well, yeah, the Leos, the Explorers. Yeah. We volunteer group, the, the Sheriff's of Volunteers and Policing, our, our Sheriff's Communications Unit. CERT, we, it, just, it was a really interesting, uh, we had 49 volunteers all together from different groups based on our sign-in sheet. And it was a great collaboration from city to county uh, to state with Highway Patrol. And uh, like you pointed out, uh, South San Francisco and San Bruno both approached and uh, will be reaching out to us to see how to do uh, similar events in their jurisdictions. And now I remember it. Um, I had a number of people said, you know, I even got this SMC alert about the bike rodeo on my phone, and that's why I'm here. So for all of you, because only about 8 or 9% of people of Millbrae have signed up for SMC alert, you lost out on a chance to get a free bicycle. So please sign up. No, it's really there for health purposes. And we had the, the lighting on Ashton and Palm and El Camino Real, and I think that made a world of difference. Plus, we have Trent in the back who sent out notices on it, so truly a team effort. Absolutely, and uh, Principal Dana Luan from uh, 
Mil the Meadows. The district was fantastic in getting out to the school children and the school age folks. So uh, lots of good credit to go around to a lot of people. So yeah. thank you again for the kind words. Can thank I ask you. for an ice cream truck too next year? <laughs> Actually, that's a, that's a great suggestion idea. for next year, an ice cream truck. Thank you. Sure Somebody gave, gave like out free too. ice cream and I don't know who that was. Okay, let's move it along. Yeah. <laughs> CHP. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you, Chief. I just want to thank Chief for his, uh, his, his philosophy of uh, community engagement and providing a better quality of life for our citizens is uh, very admirable. And your, uh, you know, your words, your action speaks louder than your words. Thank you very much. Sir? Um, and I was also impressed by the way that we market it, um, and that's kind of kind of shows you know the the street si the digital signs on different streets was uh, very effective. So I'm hoping that the city will be able to do something similar for our other events, um, and that just highlights the need for a digital sign in uh, in city hall to advertise our events. And also, we are also putting some of those events on uh, community events on our calendar, our city calendar, so you can go and and see if uh, what's going on and for use or some of you cl uh, other clubs it would also help you in your planning so you don't conflict with other clubs activities so pardon me I forgot one okay go ahead uh, strides for life um, the colon cancer uh, event was this weekend and um, so congratulations to, to them it's a very local uh, fundraiser and it's been going on now for many many years so if you hadn't gotten there this year I hope you get there next year thank you Thank you. Okay, so um, we also we had a spirit, uh, Marie Chuang, who was the council member and um, on the chi on the uh, fire board, uh, was honored as citizen of the year for the, from the Boy Scout Skyline Council. Uh, there was a, a, a nice gala, and she was uh, she's a phenomenal supporter of the Boy Scouts as well as a great community leader. So congratulations, Marie. Um, and again, thank you, Councilwoman Schneider, for the uh, for. Uh, pushing the uh, and 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 uh, initiating the bike rodeo as well as uh, working on your community garden, and uh, partnering with the mayor in uh, getting this community garden built is something that was needed for a long time, and also it just uh, after coming back from Salt Lake City, it took a train ride back from Salt Lake City uh, yesterday, and it was a phenomenal ride. Uh, and Councilwoman Papton, you know, I agree, you got to go see the temple. It's you know you know, it, 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 it it's not open to the public normally. So this is the only time that you're going to have the opportunity to go see the temple in, in Oakland. And we do have a Mormon church right behind my house, so it's very interesting. Um, and I did the 150th concert in the railroad. There was 20,000 people there. Yeah, I was just amazed. And uh, they, they, they had commemorative stamps. I got some commemorative stamps with the, uh, the only um, cancellation uh, post <coughs> stamp uh, for that day from Promontory uh, Summit. And, that, and they did it just for that. So it was just phenomenal. Um, and uh, it, so the, the significance of the Transcontinental Railroad is that it, it decreased transportation from, from uh, five months in cover wagons and, or three months over a ship to five days going across the, uh, uh, the United States. And that was uh, done under Abraham Lincoln. And it, uh, it's not just the fact that it was faster, but also uh, connected our commerce. So commerce was able to to increase, and uh, it was a really good deal for the United States investment. I mean, uh, they estimated uh, 19, per 19 times of uh, return, so 190% uh, return, so um, that's awesome. And uh, self-help for the elderly is having their celebration, the gala on June 14th at the Hyatt, um, and self-help for the elderly, they pretty much uh, provide meal three times a day at the security room at 12 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday three days a week, um, and it's free. Uh, it's, well, there's a $3 uh, suggested donation. There is entertain, well, there's activities, so the seniors can also socialize and have activities and also get a uh, nutritious meal. I will not be here on a meeting on the 28th. I'm going to uh, China on my own dime to, uh, to, to try, try to uh, create some trade opportunities and, uh, and goodwill. So um, I also went to Malta on my own dime. So <laughs> it's a very expensive year for, for the mayor. And uh, there, is a, there is a trip planned to uh, uh, Hanyu, Japan, November-ish, 8th, 9th, or something like that. And that's going to be on my own dime. <laughs> so um, so uh, I think people just 
I think, I think I, I, maybe I get my point across. At any rate, um, then on the 30th, the uh, Council of Cities, the meeting of all the council members and s mayors of, the count of San Mateo County, are, we're ho nobody's hosting, and that's, oh, 31st, sorry, keep forgetting that, 31st, last day, last Friday in the month, and uh, um, the airport director will be speaking, and uh, I think it'd be, unfortunately, I won't be there, so Vice Mayor, you're gonna have to, uh, uh, I'm just keeping a vice mayor busy. Well, you know, what's the point of having a vice mayor if you're not doing vice mayor stuff? <laughs> so anyway, um, and then uh, finally, as I mentioned before, the San Mateo County uh, Asian Pacific Islander Caucus has formed and their op uh, membership's $50. Their first event will be Ang uh, Angelica's in Redwood City on the 23rd at 6.30, so all are welcome and hopefully people will come and see what's going on and, and participate. And uh, we're going to close tonight's meeting on the Zelda Rattenberg, Rattenberg, uh, Senator Ellen Tesher, um, and a uh, longtime volunteer and senior committee, uh, senior co committee advisory co member Mary Summers, and uh, uh, yeah, she's yeah she's been sick for a little bit. And then also grandson of, uh, of Teco Lewis and uh, mother, I mean, son of um, Marsha, Marsha Perez was uh, gunned down unexpected, or, uh, you know, um, in the wrong place, in the uh, wrong time, wrong place, at a very young age, uh, Danilo A. Kaka. So we just like to, we, we're, we're sorry. Um, and, but we do have, we're celebrating the 100th birthday of oh, it was, um, Miss Aba, Abi, Masu Abi, uh, res uh, uh, Melbourne resident. So something good to say. All right, so I'm gonna close the meeting. Thank you very much.